This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 29, Episode 3. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Good morning to you. Good morning. You ready for me to tell everyone about the big show today? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. All right. So coming up in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, we're going to review the Synology Disk Station Ooh. DS412+. Plus. I have it, uh, the mm. box right here. Runs Linux, and it's got a few surprises in the box. Uh, I'll tell you, a few more surprises than I expected to see in a mm. NAS. And uh, I'll t- I'll, we'll try to get to that uh, that. Probably age-old question, is it worth the money? That's a big question, exactly. So we'll review that in the second half of the show. Of course, we've got the news of the week. I don't know if you've been following the headlines over the weekend, but there's been quite a bit of hoopla going on. There's been some discussion. Yeah, and then we've also some new software packages hitting your repo soon that I think you'll want to check out, Mm. some nice features. Then in the feedback segment, we're going to help some folks in their golden years use Linux. Not bad. That's a good idea. But first, it is our picks, and I'm very, very excited about our picks this week. Both the Spotlight and the Desktop Pick is outrageously cool. Oh, I think you guys are going to be pleased. One of your favorite apps, right? Oh, man. Yeah. I was I, I was just like, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. And we've actually given it mention, honorable mention, mm-hmm. a few times on the show, but we've never actually talked about it that much. So I'm Deserve looking forward focus. to that. Yeah. Well, first, we'll start with our Runs Linux pick this week. This has got to be one of the number one all-time sent-in picks. Every now and then something hits the news, <laughs> and a lot of people send it yep. in because it runs Linux. We got emails, yeah. tweets, several subreddit entries, mm-hmm. Google Plus threads, everything. It's like they're trying to tell us something. The Navy's newest warship runs Linux. Uh, this is the USS Zumwalt, I think is how you say it, Z-U-M-W-A-L-T. You ready for this one, Matt? Oh, my gosh. Do you know, who, do you know what the captain's name is? Oh, say Kirk. Yes, it is actually <laughs> James, it is James Kirk. It is James Kirk. Yes. No kidding. Yes, oh, my James God, Kirk. that's awesome. Uh, so it is a $3.5 billion ship designed for stealth, survivability, and firepower. It's packed wow. with advanced technology. At the heart of it is an operations center in a virtual data center powered by off-the-shelf server hardware, various flavors wow. of Linux, and over 6 million lines of software code. That is so cool. Yeah. Well, and Kirk will have nothing less. Yeah, uh, Captain James Kirk. Yes, that's actually his name. Seriously? Yep. Yeah, that's oh, actually dude. his name. So awesome. so one of the things that... Ra- so these are being built wow. by Raytheon. And a uh, wow. couple of cool things about this. So this, this is going back to that data center in a box theory that right. Sun and uh, Microsoft and have worked a lot on. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the reasons why uh, they can... one of the, So a couple of things it lets them do is A... Uh, and probably the biggest cost savings is a let's Raytheon build these all out of the shipping yard. They can build them back at their headquarters sure. and then ship them to the uh, ship. It also makes them Big modular. Benefit. Yeah, right. Right. And by using off-the-shelf hardware, mostly IBM Blade servers running Red Hat Enterprise Linux, okay. they uh, they have essentially a ruggedized server room in a box. Now, I'm looking at some orange dangly cords there. Tell me those aren't bungee cords holding that in place. They did actually <laughs> bolt these things in, It's right? power. It's okay, power, yeah. just making sure. <laughs> uh, I was a little concerned. <laughs> uh, it's got, uh, so there's gonna, the, the, the boat will have 16 of these self-contained mini data centers. Wow. 16 of them. Uh, they're 35 feet long, 8 feet high, mm. and 12 feet wide. Uh, the 16 EMEs, as they're called, have 235 equipment cabinets, wow. a.k.a. racks, in total. Uh, the EMEs tap into the total ship computing environment that the Zumwalt has. It's, it's, hmm. The Zumwalt has its own onboard ship-wide internet. Running, no kidding. Yeah, running multiple partition wow. networks over a mix of fiber and copper, redundant, which, has a, which goes into a redundantly switched network, connects all of the ship systems, internal, external communications, weapons, engineering, sensors, <laughs> over internet protocols, including TCP and UDP. And they even have a diagram in this wow. Ars Technica write-up. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's just crazy cool. And here's uh, here's what it looks like when you launch a missile right there. That's... Now, it, when you're launching a missile, are you, uh, re- <laughs> honestly, are you wanting GNOME or KDE? Because, I mean, really, that's what I want to know. It's <laughs> like, XFCE, I, mean, I can picture now, you got KDE open. It's like, okay, here's the I, settings. You okay, know I'm going to go over there. You actually, know? I think this is the perfect use case for I3 or that. Awesome. To right, yeah, right. <laughs> if I'm launching missiles, I want to do it with something awesome, like awesome. Uh, yeah. I just don't want anything getting in the way. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, here's some hatches something. that open up. They got a good picture of that. And here's a picture of wow. uh, sort of the operations center uh, virtually. Very mission control. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool, pretty cool. And uh, really awesome. here's another shot that's over on the PBS NewsHour. And one of the things they're doing is this is the data center. It's a completely detachable module all so itself. Awesome. Minus so they, the power cords, yeah. Yeah, they just pick that thing mm-hmm. up and they can set it down. It's a 1,000-ton deck house. Jeez. Yeah. 
How about that? Boy. Well, you know, and if you're uh, in uh, looking for an IT job, apparently the Navy is a, pl- a place to consider now. Uh, Mr. Gentu in our live IRC chat room says that they tried to go with GNOME, mm-hmm. but uh, during oh, one of the updates, they removed the launch missile feature from GNOME. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's an, it's an extension, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. You just got to be careful after updates. Just don't confuse it with the one that launches the Nerf <laughs> missile that you USB into the side of your computer. Right, those are yeah. different plugins. Yeah. You don't want yeah. those. Yeah. And they're right by each other in the plugin list, so just be careful. Yeah. You don't want to get those confused. You're all launching, oh, wait, that's wrong. You know, it's cool. a couple, kind of a couple of funny things. So if you didn't know, in the past, uh, a lot of these Navy ships actually ran like Windows 2000 and XP. Ugh. I know, kind of a scary Ugh. thought. And also, on a lot of them, uh, because of the power uh, requirements of both the data center and the weapon systems, they would have to shut down the data center components while they fired weapons. Were they shutting down or were they blue screening? Because <laughs> that's really what I want to know. I feel like it was, they would analyze... Then they would shut down, right. shoot, and then turn everything back on, and then see what and happened. Pray, and pray to God it does blue screen, <laughs> yeah. right? What happened while we were rebooting? Uh, so, how far Linux has <laughs> oh, brought us, goodness. and a big catch for both IBM and Red Hat. So, uh, yeah, right. That's awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, and a previous sponsor of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, Unity Sync, um, uh, was involved in synchronizing a lot of the data between these different ships. Like when they come into port, they'd wow. use Unity Sync to synchronize them and go that's between a big all the different score databases. For them there, yeah. yeah. So pretty cool runs Linux this week, mm-hmm. and thanks to everyone who sent that in on Twitter right. and email and Google Plus and the uh, subreddit. Yeah. Had a lot of good stuff. We got the message. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Matt, we got one more message to get out right. before we go into one of the coolest app picks we've had in a long time, and that is our first sponsor this week. Go! Daddy.com, go, daddy.com, go, daddy.com. So I was over the weekend, like I almost always do every weekend mm-hmm. now, rewatching the entire Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, movie catalog. Absolutely. And if you watch it all in reverse, and I'm talking all of it, <laughs> I think you'll find a secret hidden message in all of his movies. That oh, yeah? is, yeah, you ready for this? I'm ready. Show 199. No. Show 199. Is it like subliminal message? Is it in, like tattooed on the back? Show of his 199. Head, on show 199. Show one. It's wow. all over and over again. Show 199. Yeah, because you can get a dot com for a dollar ninety nine, and that Whoa. historically speaking is one of the most important things that's ever happened to a dot com. Oh yeah, I would think so. so I mean, it's like birth, right? He is a time cop. Jean Claude, this is true. He's a time cop, and right? And being a time cop, you need to make sure you're getting the best deal possible at all times. Time cops know about these kinds yes. of things. So go over to GoDaddy.com and use our code SHOW199 when you check out. You'll get a dot com for $1.99. Now, additional dot coms, $9.99. Additional years, $9.99. That's a crazy great deal. Works for me. Right there. Works for me. So you can get your first domain for $1.99. Now, Matt, you might say, Chris, what would I do? What would I do with $1.99.com? What would I do? Matt, you could do anything you want. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> Oh, all right. That's fine. <laughs> so you know here on the live stream, so the Jupiter Broadcasting uh, Network uh, does all our shows live, right? right? Yeah. And uh, one of the hardest things when you've done a lot of shows is coming up with new titles. Sure. It's, you know, it's, 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 that's work, Matt. Oh, it is work. So what we have done is we have outsourced our title generation to our live chat room. They Makes can bang, sense. suggest. But the problem was is at the end of it, we all go and vote. And I gave out this long URL that everybody oh my like it, JB Live slash five twelve yeah, niner it, you're, G. You're being generous, even to tell you the truth. <laughs> it was even worse than that. Um, I could never remember it, and I work here. I mean, it's like yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, we tried doing like a uh-huh. Bitly short thing, but not everybody yeah. remembers the Bitly thing. So I have horrible memories. What I did, I just went over, used the code show one ninety nine, and I registered jbtitles.com. Ooh, that now, I can remember. I don't have to have a server to point this at because right? it's so simple. At a dollar ninety nine, why not do it? So then. Because GoDaddy has an awesome uh, management panel, mm-hmm. I've talked about a lot of the great business class features that the GoDaddy admin panel has, but I just want to show you something that even just an average consumer can take advantage of, and I use it all the time. Yeah. You register that .com using the code SHOW199, you get it for $1.99, then mm-hmm. log into your GoDaddy control panel like I have up here on my screen. Okay. This is the forwarding. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, all you yeah. do is you just say, go in here, update forwarding, and I just say forward to HTTP, and I put the long URL that I want jbtitles.com sure. to forward to. You can see it's jbbot.jupitercolony.com, mm-hmm. even colon 5,000. It's even got a special oh, you port. Got your port, right? Okay. Now our audience doesn't have to worry about any of that because, and I can say if it's permanent or temporary, and I can say forward, and I can say forward with masking, so it even masks the URL. That's handy. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really simple, and it updates super fast. And now when people type in jbtitles.com, they'll hit the GoDaddy name server, mm-hmm. and it will automatically redirect them transparently to that longer URL. And if I ever want to point it somewhere else, I just log right back into my GoDaddy panel, and I change it. This is why registering a .com for $1.99, you can really use it for anything. You can point it at existing URLs that are just crazy long. Well, and something I did here recently is I actually moved my hosting over to GoDaddy just because I got tired of being bent over the t- table every time I had to pay my bill. And, and the, the rates are great. And what's cool is if you have domains with GoDaddy already, 
it's stupid simple to set mm-hmm. up your hosting with it. It's mm-hmm. like it's already all integrated. Click, click, Matt. Uh, it's just like, oh my God, what yeah. I do this a long time ago. I know, I know. So uh, big thanks to GoDaddy and take advantage of Jean Claude's warning from the past. Use yes. code show199 while $99.coms still exist. Use right. them up while you can, folks. And thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. And thanks to you guys for using our promo codes and keeping them here for a long, long time. We appreciate you. Keeps us on the air. That's right. All right, Matt, let me show you this app pick. Now, everybody mm-hmm. out there's probably at least heard of Armrock, and if you've heard of Armrock, there's a good chance you've heard of Clementine. Well, they kind of have a, a shared history, but they're both off doing their own thing now. Yep. And Clementine just popped out a new version, version 1.2. It did, and it's a, it's a damn good version. It sure is. There's a couple of really, really neat things going on in this version of Clementine. So let me just show okay. you Clementine if you're not familiar with it first. Uh, you don't have to have uh, 1.4 to take advantage of all this stuff, but a couple of things that I'm going to show you, you, you might. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I'll pull it up here. It is a QT application, and I'm running under GNOME. It is, but it runs really well under GNOME. It sure does, Matt. It sure does, and it just looks great. And uh, here, I'm gonna pl- I'll play a I'll play a I'll play a song here. Okay. Oh, didn't even know I had that unmuted. All right. So now, um, if one of the things I want to show you is as this music is playing uh, in my uh, GNOME menu here, you actually because I have an extension turned on, I actually get the track, the album art, play sure. controls right here, so I can play and pause. Well, should be able to play and pause. Yep. Um, and there it goes. And you see it's also down here, it's integrating with my uh, GNOME notifications. So even though, again, it's a QT app, I can control it from GNOME, and it integrates with the GNOME. And uh, I think that's an important distinguisher is that it does, it, even though it is a, you know, a QT app, that it is g- giving you that level of integration. You don't have to go fishing for extra stuff. It's going to take care of it for you yeah, when you install it. It, so. it makes it feel like it's just sure. integrated right in with the desktop. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm using the uh, Media Player Indicator extension, which allows you to just control any MP. I think it's, uh, it says right here, MPRIS2 capable media player. Right. So like Rhythmbox, Banshee, Clementine, a lot of other ones. And then it just works right with GNOME like mm-hmm. it's a native GNOME app. That's right. So that's really cool. That's, that's, that makes it nice for uh, us GNOME users. Sure. Uh, but Clementine itself is extremely powerful. It's got podcast management capabilities. It also has really, really good internet playback support. Oh, it's got great, yeah. And one of the things they've added recently <laughs> is subsonic support. So if you have a subsonic server like I do, um, Clementine will now integrate with your subsonic server and pull down all of the music tracks that you have on your subsonic server. So here we go. I have the Batman theme, and it's on. This is streaming from my subsonic server. I don't have it on my laptop at all. So this is remote, essentially remote to your LAN, anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It mm-hmm. it is remote off of my uh, my Com- file server, yeah. and uh, it, it's like no delay and, and anything like that. It's real simple to get set up, and uh, that's really nice because I have a ton of stuff on there, but. That's not the main thing I wanted to show you guys today. The main thing I wanted to show you, which is super neat, and this is one of the new features, is it also integrates in now with a really nice Android app. Very simple oh, yeah. and straightforward Android app, but it totally gets the job done, and I mean, that's what we want, it's right? It's gorgeous. It's minimalist, but the buttons are easy to see, even you know, regardless of lighting. The contrast is set well, and, all, and the controls are just what you want. Works what on I- a tablet, works on a smartphone. Mm-hmm. Nice fit. Very and uh, so I'm going to close the app. So we'll, we'll, uh, So I open up the app. Here on my uh, HTC One, and um, it'll it should automatically discover. Um, yeah, so it's automatically discovered my Clementine server already. And now what's cool is it shows you the album art of my Clementine player, so you can see uh, what you're playing, and you get uh, basic controls. So I can uh, pause. I can. Uh, so if I turn it up here, you'll. So I'll I'll skip the next track. Okay. See, and uh, Clementine does a nice fade. And it starts up the next track. And then and then down here, oh, that was the end of the playlist. And then down here, it's, it, on my GNOME desktop, I'm getting notifications of the of, of the what? commands that I've executed from my Android app. Oh, that's nice. Now, what's really neat too, Matt, is check this out. So here I have the, the, the track that mm-hmm. I was currently playing sure. in Clementine, right? If I hit the menu option here, I have a download song option in the Android oh, app, and I have God, a download right? the entire album. So I can actually download. So if I hit download song now, it's pulling down the song. And if I go check my notifications tray... Uh, I will see... There it is. So it just goes uh, to your download for, for, folder, for, I imagine. Or yeah, or right there, folder. downloading songs, mm-hmm. and it loads it to the SD card. And you can, I can uh, in the notification area, I can get a little Clementine icon. You see right there, it's got the little... Oh, uh, that's Clement- great. Yeah, it's just doing the download. So when it's finished downloading, then can it, you listen to it from Clementine? Or, uh, no, so that's... All, the Clementine, okay. it's, that, that app is only a remote. It's only remote. But okay. any app on your Android phone that can play MP3s yeah, can then access that. Anyway, yeah, so. you're pulling down the... And what's so cool about it is like... And you may not want to have a lot of songs on your SD card. You may have right, exactly. That's, that's and it's like confused. okay, so I'm gonna go and I'll grab this album, this album, this album, sure. store them on my machine, and I'm good to go. 
Uh, and and then when you're local on your LAN and you don't need them on your phone, you can still control it. So if this is like oh, playing yeah. through your home stereo or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think this is oops, not Roku. I think this is a this is like the perfect. Um, here I'm going back in here. I'm starting another one now. Yeah. So what's cool is if I change it on Clementine, it still automatically reflects the changes on the Android app. So they're oh, that's cool. They're in real time communication. Oh, I like that. That's yeah. really neat. And so uh, it's not just a remote, but it's actually you're you're getting some benefit because you're actually able to hear the music. And if I go into preferences here, it's mm -hmm. a network remote. So the way it works here is you just say uh -oh. you just turn on use network remote in your uh -huh. settings. Allow connections from the local network. I'll, you have to turn on allow downloads, and it'll show you your internal IP. So you can manually tap in the IP if you need to. But if everything's working correctly, uh, the Android device, the Android app, should just detect your Clementine player, and then you just tap the Clementine icon, and it just automatically connects wow. up, and then it immediately starts showing you what it's playing. And for audio listeners, when you're looking at this, uh, the preferences, you're literally looking at toggle boxes that you check each individual option. And then it looks like you can get the app by either using uh, the little, yeah, they got a little link here or the or, QR code. Yeah, the QR code right there. Yep. Bam. Boom. Done. Yeah, and then it just you just download the Clementine player, which yep. is free. Uh, and oh, like you can that. also like if you have Last FM support, you can mark your Last FM songs in oh, here. Oh really? Yeah, you can you oh. can ban a song from playing from the Android player, which is nice. You can set repeat and loops mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, shuffle. You can change all of that from here. Uh, and that. here's the here's a quick example of the uh, Subsonic integration. So I've just uh, signed in. Once mm -hmm. you put in your information, it just connects to your Subsonic installation and pulls down all the tracks from that as well. Very cool. Yeah, it is. Uh, Clementine, it just keeps getting better and better and better. And now it's really gotten at the point where it, it to me, it's. It, I love the UI. I love the functionality. And now with that Android app tie-in, so I can pull something out of my pocket and I can go to the next song without having to be in the same room is really nice. Oh, definitely. And not having to use the storage on your phone is also awesome. But mm -hmm. you know my favorite feature of that app hmm. is the fact that you have fruit for a slider for your volume. <laughs> yeah, that's important yeah. to me. And the and the uh, and the player. That's the player indicator yeah. too. The little, yeah. little fruit piece. Yeah. It's all about the fruit, man. <laughs> it's like I'm going to slide my fruit. Yeah. So. Uh, cool. Um, you know, I, I, I just installed this version uh, yesterday, and I've been mm -hmm. playing with it. I, just, I was so impressed that I wanted to talk about it. But I, one of the other things I didn't quite get worked out was it, it sees my HTC One, but I haven't been able to get sync working yet with oh, my really? HTC okay. One. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. You could, could just be needing to rule out an update. And one other caveat is uh, you can use the Clementine remote to remotely control your internet song. So, like, if you have a subsonic setup That's or a nice. uh, podcast or a Spotify setup in Clementine, the Clementine remote on Android can still control them, but it cannot download tracks from those services. Oh, okay. So it can only download when a song is in your uh, local media library, which sure. kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I can handle that. Yeah, exactly. So Sounds that is good. Clementine combined with the Android app. And if you're a GNOME user, I also give a hearty recommendation to the media player indicator. Mm. So that way you can have Clementine integrated into your GNOME system yeah, right. menu over here. Very clean. Yeah, it is. it's very clean. It works super, super easy and just like you'd expect. So I was pretty happy with that. Clementine, Media Player Extension, and the Clementine Remote, all which, absolutely free. Gotta love the price, gotta love the features. In fact, do they say, uh, let's see, you have to have 1.2, by the way, for the remote to work. I imagine so. So, yeah, yeah that's kind of a newer thing. That seems reasonable, though. Um, no, yeah, okay. I was just checking to see if there's any other gotchas, but yeah. that's it. There you have it. Oh, uh, that's what I was looking for, too. And the Android app is GPL3. Gosh, that's great. Can't complain about that, no. can you? So that's kind of an Android app and a desktop pick all in one for you, Matt. How about Good that? Good stuff. All right, now we do have a weekly spotlight I just want to spend a moment on. Okay. Um, I mentioned it on Linux Unplugged. We, yeah, we did talk about it a little bit. And, be, and that's one I need to look into more myself because I'm curious. I wanted to give them a, I wanted to give them a full, full plug here on the big show because um, now I'm not trying to take any particular stance here. There could be, there could be problems with it, but I loaded this up. Um, in a VM, mm -hmm. and I've been using it to try out Cinnamon too. Sure. And uh, Integros is how you pronounce it, I think. I think so. I believe Integros. so. It is. It is sort of if if you're familiar with um, uh, what distro Manjaro. Uh, Manjaro, yes. So Manjaro has its own private repositories where they 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 pull from the Arch repos and yeah, they, they pull them and then they freeze it and let it sit for a couple weeks or whatever. Yeah. It is. Sure. So Integros doesn't do that. Integros is straight from the Arch repos. And uh, the other thing they do that's kind of interesting, get ready for this, kids, is they use the Ubiquiti installer from Ubuntu. Oh, really? That's so if you know how to install Ubuntu, you can install Integros. And when you're done with that, you have a fully up-to-date uh, Arch installation. So you have the options to do an open box, KDE, GNOME, a few other options when you're installing. Mm -hmm. And once you click the install button, it pulls the latest packages from the Arch repo. So even though oh. they haven't... They haven't burned a new ISO image 
in since about like August, I think. Doesn't matter because you're just going to update it anyway. It's yeah, all as you install it, pulls down the absolute latest kernel, the absolute latest GNOME packages. Everything is fresh from the Arch repo. Every update comes from the Arch repo. They do have their own private repository, but it, it has like minor things in there, like uh, a couple of LibreOffice, small stuff. Little niceties. Yeah. 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 Okay. Otherwise, it's almost completely, totally minimal. In fact, there's tons of stuff you'll still have to install. So you, it doesn't, it, it, it basically gets you up and running with a full uh, desktop environment of your choice using the Ubuntu installer. And then from that point forward, all future updates hmm. are delivered from the Arch repos. It is, it is, I like as far that. as I can tell, it is completely Arch. That's very cool. I mean, with the with the exemption of those niceties that we talked about, which sound like they're very minimal, um, it sounds like it's just a ready to roll Arch based distribution. It's ready to go. Yeah, as Heaven's Revenge in the chat room points out, it is it is actual Arch with hmm. the tiniest repo and some sane defaults. Now, Blue Phoenix in the chat room has been mentioning that he's actually had some problems installing it. Uh, I just installed it. Um, uh, Monday, I think it was. Did he elaborate on what the problems were? Display, uh, physically completing an installation. Um, you know, just, I'm not sure. I, I'd be interesting to know what the where the hangup was specifically, so that we can. But I'll tell you, yeah, I'll but tell it looks you, really good. Pairing that Ubiquity installer, which yeah. um, I guess Manjaro kind of does too, yeah. uh, with Integros uh, Arch, brilliant. I mean, mm -hmm. to sit down and go and and to sit down and within 15, 20 minutes have right. a fully up to date modern Arch installation with GNOME three ten one. And we're talking GNOME. You can have GNOME three ten one in about twenty five minutes by loading this up, and then you just now. Obviously, you're going to cheat yourself on some of the learning experience by going through an install. But if you've been curious what we've been talking about and things like that, this is a good way to at least kick the tires and see what's I up. I think that's a great. I think that's a great approach. I think that everybody at some point in their life should at least try an Arch installation to actually experience it. But I also think that if you just want something, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, get it up and running. This is a great option. Yeah, I you know I kind of go back to like um, I you think know. if I had known how great the package repo was and stuff like yeah. that, I probably would have tried going to Arch a long time ago. That was what but that installation yeah. is such a barrier for some folks. Yeah. And this distro totally eliminates that. And it depends, and the barrier varies on the individual. So for some people, it's a perceived time barrier. And for other people, it's a it's an actual uh, doability barrier. Yeah. It just yeah. depends on the person. So. Um, I don't, you know, I tried to suss out how active uh, this project is because, see, they haven't, so they've been. See, they, that's what put me into Manjaro's camp initially. It's yeah. just, I, for one thing, it was literally, initially it was an experiment because I was just curious. I was just like, oh, wow, I've heard lots of negative things about it. I'm going to try this. Right. That's just how I operate. Yeah. And it was like, oh, I've really not had any problems. So I was yeah, like, okay, I, I cool. reached out to them on Twitter and uh, never heard back from them, but they haven't even updated. They haven't, they haven't updated some, Twitter since 26. They may be. Yeah. Kind of. Well, I guess it's one of those distributions, though, that if everything's pretty minimal you, yeah. and it's all Arch repos, you really don't care. Yeah, and I checked it's their fine, GitHub yeah. repo, and it, it, I saw it, there's been activity within the last few days. Yeah, so, so that's stuff probably how it's just developers at that point. Yeah, okay. I think this is kind of the advantage yeah. is you don't have to have a large in-house staff to, because you're you're just taking what Arch already has available mm -hmm. and just putting it together. Yeah. Um, so it, it might I not think require it sounds cool. Team. I might check that out. I invited them on the show, so if they're watching yeah. and like to talk to us about what they're up to. I'd be really curious because um, this is an early, I think it's kind of, there's some more things they're going to do with it, and I hope they mm -hmm. stick around. It's pretty fascinating. There you go. And Tego Ros, and uh, we'll have a link to that Good in the show notes as well as a link to all the other picks That's we've right. talked about. All right, Matt, let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com. Matt, you know that. Ting is mobile that makes sense. My mobile service provider and Matt's mobile service provider, Ting, powers our smartphones of awesomeness. And uh, I got to tell you, Matt, now has never, ever, ever been a better time. Never, right. ever, ever been a better time to switch to Ting. Let me tell covered. you. So Ting, of course, you all know, no contracts, no determination fees. I think we're all savvy enough to know how mm -hmm. awesome that is. No bundling ride-along services. We appreciate that. And, of course, include hotspot and tethering with your cell service. We all like that, too. One of the things that really makes Ting stand out, and they've been pioneering this, is the way they do their billing. You only pay for what you use. So you're not paying into a big contract okay. that you don't end up using. You don't get the value out of No, no, no. You get always get value from Ting because you're only paying for what you need. Minutes, text messages, megabytes are all added up at the end of the month. Whatever bucket you fall into, pow, that's what you get right. charged. But I did mention something, Matt. I know, I know I've mentioned they have an awesome online control panel. I know I've mentioned you can call oh, yes. 1-855-TING-FTW anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. to get a real person and take care of your problem. Uh, but did you know that Ting is now doing golden tickets? Golden tickets? Yeah, Matt. These Holy, golden, this really is fun. Them. And this is only until the end of October, yeah. so you guys got to jump on it now. So they have six golden tickets available, and if you buy a phone from Ting, they come in the new Ting portfolio, and up to three of those will have a golden ticket oh. slipped in there. Now, if you get a golden oh. ticket, you get a year of Ting service for free. Now you got some good chances here, folks, so move on this. Now, don't worry. 
if you're going to bring your own device over to Ting when you visit last.ting.com, they're going to also slip in a digital golden ticket for those oh, guys, right too. on. So even if you're so buying you, online— So everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to play, nice. Matt. It is fair for everybody. This go a year of Ting service. I, I can't even. I can't even imagine that'd be so awesome. That would be great. Now, average Ting bill is twenty one dollars per month per device. That is not too bad if you think about it. And of course, all of Ting devices are unlocked. You can go over there and get a used device, a new device. You can bring your own device. Yeah, they got a list of ones you can bring. And also, if you've got a gently used Moto X, I don't even know how gentle it has to be. Ting's giving up to a hundred dollar Visa gi uh, gift card. Ooh. For certain qualified Moto X's, they have that over at uh, the Ting blog. Wow. So look, here's how here's how you get started. Goodness. You go to last.ting.com. Okay, that's going to take twenty five dollars off your first device, or if you bring your own device, they're going to take twenty five dollars off your first month. So that's going to get you in the door, dude. For me, that made yeah. my first month free. Right, that was yeah. awesome. Now I'm a, I'm a paying Ting customer. I don't sure. I don't get a deal. Here. Yep. I don't get a deal. Nope. I'm paying for this full. I'm full fledged here. I paid full price for my HTC that's One. Right. And I absolutely love it. Ting combines some of the best Android phones. Just got the 4.3 update with some of the best service that lets you do anything you need on your terms. If you need a gigabyte this month and only 500 megabytes next month, Ting is going to take care of you on there. If you only need 10 minutes one week and then the next week you need 30 minutes, whatever, whatever exactly. your usage is, Ting has got you covered. In fact... Uh, I love this for small businesses because sometimes you have folks on your team who use a lot of minutes. Yeah. Sometimes you have folks on your team who barely use their phone. And so that's with, with it for me. It's I'm very heavy in data, but not so much in the voice. Yeah. And it allows me to do that. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. And I get I get a fantastic deal on Ting. You know, because I'm using Waze. I'm using yeah. I'm using G Plus on this all the time. I'm constantly taking pictures and uploading them via BitTorrent Sync. So the data is a big part. And what's great about Ting is a lot of areas now are getting lit up with LTE they are. service. And that is awesome. LTE is like magic in your phone. So go to last.ting.com. That'll get you started. Also, I encourage you to click on that how much would you save button. If you're if you're kind of on the fence, that, this is it's this is you got to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, I want you to take in consideration that Ting has an early termination relief program. Now, this is going to help you get out of that contract so you can start saving even sooner. They'll give you up to $75 per device. All you have to do, you'll go pick out your Ting device, you port your number, and then you submit your ETF claim, and they'll take $75 off that ETF if it qualifies. That's and they make the whole process easy. I mean, it's super not, yeah, easy. It's not like it, it sounds like, oh my gosh, I got to do what now? No, you just go through the go through the motions. They'll take mm -hmm, care of you. Mm -hmm. And their website's very, very straightforward. That's right. They've got online user forms if you don't want to have to call somebody. But if you do, like we mentioned earlier, they legitimately have Canadians standing by to take your call when you call 1 855 Ting FTW. Not only does a real person answer the phone, but that person owns your problem. And they will see it through the beginning to the end and make sure it gets resolution. They'll even give you your their direct number in some cases. See, if they that's need to. a big piece because how many times have you called for support or something and then you're handed off to that next person? Oh yeah, this doesn't happen with Ting. No, no, no. They're, they, 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 their support folks are empowered to solve your that's problem. Right. It's pretty awesome. So go to last.ting.com and thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Woo Love Ting. Love these guys. Loving my phone still. Man. You're right. Yeah. Loving it. Loving it. All right. So oh. this week's news docket. It's packed with a few stories that I honestly hoped we weren't going to have to cover. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've talked a lot about Ubuntu in the last few weeks because the 1310 review is here, so that was the time. To it was kind of an event. Yeah. You know? and, and honestly, the goal of this week's episode was really not to avoid the topic of Ubuntu, but just really not to focus on it anymore because... To focus on other cool things that we're equally excited about. Yeah, we've set yeah. our bed, and yeah. uh, there's, we, we, there's things we like, and, yeah, and so forth. However, however... Uh, if you uh, didn't check the interwebs over the weekend, there's a bit mm. of a kerfuffle that was kicked up. It started mm. on Friday when Mark Shuttleworth po took to his blog mm. to uh, not only sort of celebrate the release of 1310, but to also announce the name for 1404. Starts off nice enough. So. Yeah, it, it really does start out quite good. He talks yeah. about how 1310 is officially out the door, and it's a wonderful achievement. Yeah. A real, you know, go team kind of. Absolutely. Exactly what no you problems expect. there. Yeah. Uh, later on in the article, this is where... And unfortunately, it's gotten the majority of the attention. This is kind of where things went off the rails. Uh, Mark writes, Canonical has its fair share of competitors and detractors who love to undermine the work it does. But I think that wiser heads appreciate the magnitude of the effort required to break this ice. He's talking about going to mobile. And the extent to which it's taken courage and grace under fire for this team to deliver such a sharp 1.0 of the mobile experience for Ubuntu. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, Canonical has its fair share of contracts. Sure. But that is, you I know, think, he, a legitimate... He, he, it was legitimate. He was. He's kind of. You can see where he was going as you keep reading. But yeah, yeah. It, it's edging out there. Yeah, uh, I yeah. think uh, you know there are people out there who like to bang on it just because sure. it's from Canonical. Uh, he goes. He talks a little more. He goes on to talk about Mirror. He says Mirror is really important work uh, with lots of uh, When lots of competitors attack a project on 
purely political grounds, you have to wonder what their agenda is. At least we know who belongs to the open source Tea Party. Oh, see, that was a... Yeah, I, I understand his concern, frustration, what have you, but I also know that once you put words out there, they're really hard to retract, and I think he's experiencing that now. Well, and it, and I think that was poor choice. The, the, the analogy so. between um, folks in the open source community who who think Mir is a bad decision and the Tea Party is kind of a weak analogy to begin with. Well, it, does it, yeah, they don't it, really, it, yeah, and 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 perhaps from an outsider's point of view, for someone that doesn't live in the states, that maybe that's how he interpreted it. I don't know. Yeah, but um, it, but it definitely is a, it's a, it's a very hot topic with people that probably would have done better to because what's happened is everybody's now focusing on that terminology right. versus the context of the article and you know uh, it was you know, mark was taking so i i believe now this is my interpretation but when mark says that so sure. I, I you know the world view just based on what i hear from a lot of uh, unfiltered emailers who live which outside is great the world, to get the you know get that third party the, view. the tea party yeah. is seen as a, an obstructionist group who yeah. will go to no ends to see their agenda and who are radical and block rational Discourse now. This I've, is this is the offshore interpretation. Right. Right. I'm not I'm not prescribing that. I'm on agnostic, them. honestly. So, but I that is sort it. of the uh, no. offshore uh, view. So I, I and I believe he is taking those sort of stereotypes, right? And and, and potentially, you know, that's what he's that's sure. kind of what he's using there. Sure. Uh, but he goes on to say, and this is kind of why he doesn't understand why Mir has gotten so much heat. He says Mir is relevant for approximately one percent of all developers, just those who think about shell development. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. app developer will consume Mir through their toolkit. Okay. Now. I, I, I think technically that's not a correct statement. But wishful thinking, maybe I don't know. Maybe I mean, on the very, very large, broad okay. picture, it's it's correct. But sure. I mean, in reality, I think anybody who's made an application on the Linux desktop at some point has yeah. to deal with X issues. And, and again, like this that. is his interpretation. Your right. mileage may vary. Uh, yeah. Mirror Mirror is relevant for. He goes on to say, so it's relevant for one percent. Those are just the developers. By right. contrast, those same outraged individuals have not invented here just about every important piece of the stack they can get their hands on. Most notably, System D which is hugely invasive and hardly justified. When clo uh, what, close hmm. what closely to see how competitors to Canonical torture the... That's, that's what? He made a typo. So you can tell it's very probable that he got a little flustered about this point. What closely to see how competitors to Canonical yeah. torture the English language in their efforts to justify how those toolkits should support Windows but not Mir. So he's kind of talking about like KWIN and things yeah. in, in KD, uh, QT where they're going to a lot of efforts to make sure that Windows support is there, but not necessarily Mir. Um, and he goes on to say that, I think when he says when they torture the English language, they're going through lengthy blog posts to talk sure, about right. the justification. And, well, and, his, and his point on System D, I mean, again, this is his interpretation of it. I use System D. I'm quite content with it, honestly. I've yeah. actually had less problems with it than I have with the alternative. So, you know, and again, I'm agnostic on this whole thing, but I, I, I disagree with him on that. So, so you yeah. have to, so I think to appreciate the System D comment, um, sure. First of all, I think it's this is just me being nitpicky. Sure. I think it's interesting that he typoed the system D has no uppercases and it's not intercased. Right. Um, it is all lowercase. And the only reason I mention that is because um, if you're familiar with system D, mm -hmm. you know that's kind of a big deal about system D, that they've covered this a lot. In fact, there's even a free desktop.org page mm -hmm. dedicated to how you're supposed to type system D. Um, and so by getting it wrong, it might imply a little infamiliarity with the project. So just keep that in mind. Sure, but sure. Uh, you know, I, I look at it this. So this, uh, he goes on to say, you know, there's politics, there's an agenda, uh, and he brings up Mir, he brings up System D. The politics and agenda he'd be talking about is Canonical versus Red Hat. And if you think about where Canonical actually makes their money, Canonical makes their money on the cloud. The cloud would be the number one spot they're competing with Red Hat. Right. So now so now it's become, it's become very hyper-competitive amongst two competitors, and I get that. So there's going to be some emotion there, there's going to be some tension, sure. Uh, fair. Yeah, and so it doesn't. Yeah. So the, the reason why that's a little bit, I think, of a faulty assumption to make is um, Upstart was chosen by Red Hat for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. The oh. team there deployed it. Right. They shipped, you know, a multi-year supported distribution using Upstart, mm -hmm. and they looked at it from from that perspective. Lenart Pottering and the other people on his team looked at it from that perspective. From and a said, deployed perspective, right? We have this deployed. To potentially millions of servers sure. running in data centers, and we feel that Upstart isn't solving the problems that we have. It was a good first try, but it they, the thing is, is Upstart's kind of reached a point and really hasn't moved forward a lot, and it still is sort of has ties to the legacy way of doing things. So perhaps Red Hat saying 
it's not good enough. We have these concerns that aren't being addressed. Mark is saying perhaps that it is good enough. I fail right. to see the problem. Right. And but what's going, you know. The other so thing you have to, but see, okay, the reason why it also doesn't work is because the market has chosen SystemD. That is right? true. Arch, yeah. by and large. OpenSUSE, yeah. Fedora, That's right. uh, Debian. They're and that all, may be a sore spot for Mark. Yeah. They're all, but I, I think you when, when you have the entire market deciding on a technology like that, it might be an indicator that there's some technological reasons for that, not just political reasons. Because yeah. you have other competing entities like Novell, Sousa, or um, not Novell anymore, but uh, Auto. Right. Um, I'm forgetting their names. But yeah, right. uh, they're essentially competitors with Red Hat, and they're sure. choosing system. Right, right. So I think it's more than just a political thing. Well, and I don't. I mean, there's definitely politics in Linux. I'm not going to pretend like there's not. But I think in this particular case, it, a lot of it is very likely practical in the fact that they can point to deployed situation to where they weren't happy with it. They're not just talking about it. They actually tried it. it wasn't for them. They want to. Try, they want to use System D because for practical reasons. That that seems to be my interpretation of the situation. As someone that's you know trying very hard not to get you know there's get into the sides. And of it, I don't but, mean to pick because there's also a lot of good yeah. stuff. He says I'm very proud to be as the register puts it the Ubuntu daddy. Uh, my affection for this community is in the broadest sense from Mint to our cloud developer audience and the teams at Canonical and each of our derivatives. It's a very it's very tangible today. He says as such our focus is going to be on performance, refinement, manageability, technical debt. Uh, it would be entirely appropriate for us to make conservative choices for the upcoming uh, VUDSs, the Virtual mm -hmm. Developer Summits. So please join us for the discussion as we shape 1404. Uh, he, he, he announces they're going to name it Trusty Tar. Tar? <laughs> See, and the rest of I the post... It's, good. Yeah, it's real good, right? Yeah, the, the rest, rest of the post, post is, is real great. good. Yeah. I, I think that he hit on a sore subject that... Pro th this is... For calling, yeah. calling out SystemD and calling out Mir and calling out ca calling people who are against it the Open Source Tea Party... It, yeah, I mean, the, so here's the thing, and it's this like, is how it works with companies I do. Even like throwing gas yeah, on the fire. Even you know, regardless of where you're at in the company, generally speaking, when you put something out, you have someone vet your post before it goes out. Not because you're, not because of editing mistakes or anything like that, but sometimes a tone can be misinterpreted, or it just comes out really douchey, depending on how which way you want to go with it. Uh, you know, get someone to vet the stuff before it goes out there, because even if you didn't mean it the way it sounds, it does sound really. Yeah. Abrupt, you know, and douchey, honestly. <laughs> like uh, KP you in know. the chat room says, is this is really kind of like a it's a like a it's a bad news sandwich because right. it's it's yeah, it's, it's bad news sandwich between good news here. I I think um you know I think you nailed it. I think if we as so uh, that the, the call outs to Mir and System D and the open source Tea Party yeah generated a massive response online. Oh yeah, uh, just, just a, a massive, little yeah, and it really and this is the blowback and this is why I say I, I you know you got to vet the stuff before you put it out there, right. guys. Or just go with the original post that Jono made, which was great. Yeah, that's my point. Well, that's what I'm saying. He and, and I know Jono agrees with me. He's yeah. going to want it. He, he wants to vet this. I know he does. I yeah, know he sure, wants to vet this sure. before it goes out the door. Because he knows his, how it's going to go well, over. It's, it's his butt that gets chewed. So honestly. Aaron, uh, pretty quickly, so. uh, Aaron Saigo uh, took to G+, and uh, he called out uh, specifically where Mark said, Mir is really yeah. important work with lots of uh, competitors. Attack the project on purely sure, political sure. grounds. You have to wonder what their agenda is. So uh, Aaron and I kind can of took offense. Him being upset by that. I mean, I, I get Aaron's point of view on that. I do. And what Aaron what Aaron essentially called for was he said, "Let's do an online live right. debate. Let's go on the Linux Action Show and let's discuss the merits of Mir and Wayland and the implications of uh, free software." Now, if uh, we did a presidential debate style, it might work, yeah. maybe. Yeah. But it, we, we would we have to you, we'd have to have certain guidelines in place to where yeah. everybody's just you know. Yeah, and I think you know I think one thing people have to keep in mind is both Aaron and Mark are classy guys. I think oh, yeah. if they were on, so this is we could see them having beers together in another situation. This is why I said know. yes to this proposal because right. I feel like if you had two people sitting down and talking instead of talking through their blogs, right, there would be a much more real uh, with less rhetoric type conversation. There would be a. I think this, well, I think this. Exactly. And there wouldn't be people taking blog posts, interpreting them, writing their own blog posts with thousands of comments on those posts, getting to Slashdot and getting to Reddit. And, right. you know, I mean, Well, and tone is easily misinterpreted in text. That's why I'm always doing smiley faces. It's not because I'm a giggling idiot. It's honestly because of the fact that I need people to understand that I'm not upset with you, but here's my point. Now, it's and that's hard to do in text. I think the fundamental problem yeah. here is um, the open source community is looking at Mir and other mm -hmm. things and saying, you know, I mean, hell, this goes back to Launchpad even. They're looking right. at this stuff and saying, this causes unnecessary fragmentation. Okay. Um, and the core argument they have is, at a time when a lot of us are working together, you're introducing fragmentation. And if you remember, some of the original arguments against why they had to create Mir and go against Wayland mm -hmm. were based on kind of, you know, things they had to retract off their wiki, right? right? So it kind of set the tone. And I, I kind of feel like, 
while a lot of people are are harshing on Saigo and other folks saying, you know, Mark has even said and Jono said is, hey, we just want to create code, man. Get off our back so we can just create code. I don't understand why you're harshing on our buzz here. Right. We're just trying to make code, dude, and this is open right. source and it's going to be open code, man. And can't we all just get along, dude? But the reality is, is the tone keeps getting pushed into the more and more aggressive channels by Canonical, not by Lenart, not by Aaron Saigo. But when they when they launch things, the way those launches have been handled set the tone of the conversation. When they launched Mir on the grounds that Wayland wasn't capable enough and that Wayland was deficient, and they said it was deficient in ways that it was not actually deficient, right. they then set the stage for future conversations around that. And then, as we remember, this has happened the last time Mark made a big blog post, mm -hmm. something gets said yep. that upsets people and then sets the tone another level to a little more hostile. And, and I think, yeah. again... When well, Mark came out and said the Tea Party thing, I think that set the tone of the conversation a bit more aggressively. It did. No, there's no question of that. I and so here here's the thing. Like when they, you know, when they're saying Wayland wasn't meeting their needs, that's probably a better way of saying it in the way that it was said. Th using choice words and then leaving it alone. Just but saying, look, you didn't meet also, our needs and whatever, Do you see you know? some hypercriticalness here when Mark comes out and says, Well, look, system D and 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 all these things are mm -hmm. a product of the not invented here syndrome. And and the guy that's saying that is the guy behind. Oh, Mark's not helping the situation. Launchpad, there's no question about none. Unity, none yeah, no, there's mirror. no question that he is definitely. I don't. I don't want to say he's Steve Ballmer in the situation, but he I'd kind say he's of, more he, Steve Jobs in it. In Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs could get away with it. Though. It's a little revisionist he's, in a sense. As messed up as it is, Steve Jobs got away with it. No, I, I think that he thinks that he. Can, you know, I mean, it's his opinion, and, and he wants to express it, and that's fine. But you, you got to understand, for every action, there's an equal and sometimes even greater reaction. Oh, I think Mark knows that, though. But I think, but I think he's in denial about it. I think that he he can't fathom how people aren't getting it from his perspective. Right. I, think I completely the, agree. And so, you know, and I'm concerned about that. Um, all of this just sort of built. So that started on Friday, built over sure. the whole weekend. Last night, Sunday at 4 a.m., Mark Shuttleworth posted G plus. Yeah. <laughs> and his response, uh, surprisingly, wasn't actually directed at Aaron who has actually been sort of leading the response to this. Yeah. Instead, it's pointed at Lenart Pottering. Right. Mark's opening line, Lenart completely misses the point. Now, I've checked Lenart's social posts and his blog posts and his Twitter. He really didn't much well, it would have help to say He actually provided a link for context. So I can, yeah. He says, uh, so he goes on to say, what is hypercritical uh, is the tendency, this is Mark, yeah. and the many, uh, and many colleagues who rant about Canonical is to project someone else's right to do the same. Constant partisan critiques of code purely for existing is bizarrely political approach. See, this goes, Mark's not getting it. See, he thinks people are upset that they're creating code. Yeah. But that's not what people are that's upset what about. I'm saying. That's what I'm saying where Mark's not understanding what the concern is. He, he's living very much in a, in a singular vision, and that's kind of the guy he is. We are on a mission. We're on a mission. And these and, people are detracting from yeah, our mission. And you're either, on board, you're either on the ship with us or you're a stowaway. I mean, that's. I mean, you're in the way, and you're bugging us, and we we need you to just get out of the road. He, so he further your point so, by yeah. saying, "I think it's telling that the harshest criticisms yeah. of Upstart and Mir has nothing to do with code, but rather the company it comes from." And that again, there is a degree of that. There, yeah, I mean, there, it's his interpretation. I th I think that there is definitely those that feel that way, but I don't think that by and large that's all of it. I think it's much greater than that for a lot of folks. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and then Mark says, sure. "Ask yourself, you know. do you want more innovation?" Why would you trash someone's efforts to prove any aspect of the free software stack? Because so, I mean, at that point, he could, you know, he could go after Stallman or anyone else that, you know, is even going further down the line as far as their uh, concerns. I, you know, at the end of the day, put out, say your piece, and just focus on what you need to focus on. That's I, see, that's my philosophy. I kind of feel keep like feeding it back, and, and that's forward, what Jono. That's, see, this is what's interesting. This is kind of what Mark's take is now, and that's what Jono's initial response was. Well, guys, 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 let's just focus on the code. Right. But the but the problem is. It's kind of like they came in and smacked the hornet's nest and then complained that the hornet stung. Right. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, because, well, and like, this in here, to me, is this... Have, but you have different mindsets within the company. You have one mindset, which is Mark's mindset, of he did, he did in fact, smack the hornet's nest. And then the other employees of the company are then left to pick up those pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's where I... I feel bad for those that are affected because that's kind of the, that's the situation they're put in. It's like, okay, now they have to come in and say, no, actually, for us personally, this is how we see it. And everybody right. thinks that uh, yeah. thinks canonicals like this hive brain, and it's not. And there I are think, individual people with individual opinions. I know? think uh, I think when you read this, and you keep in mind, I I truly believe that Mark thinks that Red Hat is the bad guy. Red Hat is their number one competition, and I think he sees a lot of those actions. 
through that lens. And maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe maybe be. behind the scenes there's a lot of political things going on that we don't some. appreciate. I'm sure I'm sure there are. But I, I at the end of the day, product you know, it's, being right is a very lonely way to live. I said this earlier uh, when we you know earlier in the show. And I think it's important to remember that you can be right all day long, but it doesn't mean the hoes around you are going to agree with you. It just doesn't. It doesn't matter. What matters is yeah. accepting. Everybody's got their opinion. Can can we cooperate at some level? Mm-hmm. If not, can we at least be cordial to one another? And I think the know? key here is is the community. And when I say community, I mean like Aaron, Mark. Or I mean Aaron, Lenart, yeah. uh, Martin, some other folks sure. who've been chiming in. They're talking. They're talking about the technical aspects of it. They're talking about the community aspects mm-hmm. of it. They're talking about the long term impacts of it. Absolutely. And Mark is talking about vision about pushing okay. forward the mobile platform about uh creating a unified experience that they have full control over sure. and the thing is is they're not even debating the same things they're not even they're, they're not even thinking about the completely same things. completely right. talking at each other at this point right they're talking completely at each other and so uh there's there's really no there's really no progress being made on either side and and and, and i think maybe that's why an actual in person debate would actually potentially help but i go back to this at the end of the day, none of this needed to happen. No, if really, you go it, back, what you, did it accomplish? That's my that's my philosophy. I, I have it all. I have it highlighted in the show notes. If you go look in the show notes to Mark's blog post, if you just remove the spots that I have highlighted, yeah. it's a great blog post. Yeah, and it doesn't cause any of this drama, and it allows people to just go back and focus on what they're doing. I mean, I think we'd all like to just see the market prove which approach that is would better. be the logical approach yeah. that would be that and and unfortunately we're not but people aren't robots and they make choices that sometimes bite them in the butt and, and i think it's what we're seeing here so i guess so. the flip side is is i think it's pretty clear that mark has genuine true passion about what they're oh yeah forward, no, he's right? crazy passionate about what he's yeah. doing as you know as is crazy the crazy yeah. passion it might actually be the right way to describe it sure, uh, and, sure. and, and and what i mean by that is i think we could probably agree and this is this just happens when you're really really you know, involved with something, yeah. there's there's some perspective lost. There's a little bit of perspective that's been lost. And so it, when you match that with the fact that they're not really having the same conversation, you get nowhere. That's you, right. And then and then what you get is the BSD guys and the commercial software guys sitting back and laughing at the open source community. Yeah, they, right? uh, yeah they, they're thinking, this is why we don't, you know, and then of course then they'll stereotype their own thing, and they will. Um, and believe me, I know they are already. So. And I, I believe, <laughs> I believe this... I you know I think part of this too is a little bit of sore butt over the response to thirteen ten. It wasn't just our review that was like mm, you know good but meh. Every review was good but meh. Yeah. Every review was it's good release but it's meh. And I think that still hurts a little. I think I think what we're seeing here is the Ubuntu desktop is still important to these guys. Sure. And when people criticize it a little bit, they start to get a little hurt. And when you start criticizing something that impacts also their new vision. Then they really respond. Well, and I also think that you're you're participating in a space to where rolling releases are becoming increasingly popular, and so the idea of a, a release party or an event of a new release has become kind of, is really less important than it was two three years ago. Um, it who cares? I mean, that's kind of I'm not saying that legitimately. I mean, that's how a lot of people perceive it. Of is that it's like yeah, but I'm running this other distro over here, and I've already had those features for three months now. And I also wonder if you the know, smart scopes so. thing hasn't been pushed. You know, very hardly by Mark himself. I wonder if yeah. Mark's been sort of the, the chief advocate of the smart scopes. And like the chat room is saying, every single review out there said, Ubuntu's great, just turn off the smart scopes. Right. I mean, that I, I is sus- universally bad. Personally, based on my understanding how this stuff comes about, I suspect it was introduced as a marketing idea by someone else in the company. And it was probably, and Mark saw it as, oh, this is great. It fell into his vision scope. Pun intended, <laughs> and you know, and he shot forward with it to where yeah. once it's in, once in Mark's ton- Mark's it's part, vision, yeah, it's part yeah. of the narrative, yeah, part of his narrative, yeah, exactly. And so he took it and ran with it, and now it's part of his personality, it's part of who he is, it's, it's part, part of the vision for the part desktop, of his vision, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. So you know, yeah, yeah that's tough. It's now tough. I, 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 we'll move on. We'll move on. <laughs> we've said our, we've covered it, and so. you know, well, neither one of us want to take too hard of a stance because I think both parties have some justifiable yeah, I, uh, grievances here. However, um, I. I I, I really wish Mark would use his position as a figurehead in the community to to change the direction of these conversations and not make them worse. Um, and I realize that's asking a lot when you feel like you're under attack, and it's almost inconceivable because I realize at the end of the day you're a person too, and you know this stuff feels like they're attacking you. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like when the president says something, it has huge ramifications. Like there's a red line right here, and then. Everybody talks about a red and, and line. He, and here's why this is a big issue. With, with the president is a great example. Generally, the cabinet members are yes-men. 
And that's, <laughs> uh, that's essentially what we're dealing with here is you're dealing with, you have a lot of people that are also equally passionate about the same stuff that Mark is passionate about. You need to integrate some people in there that think you're full of beans because when that happens, it makes you think critically and, and that needs to happen. You need to add yeah. maybe one or two people in there that maybe don't agree with you. Yeah. And uh, that are really adamantly disagreeing with you and say, no, actually, I think the direction we're going is wrong, and here's why. doesn't mean you're going to agree with them, Mark, but it's just something to consider. You remember, I go back, and I so, remember I said a few weeks ago, I think developers have, some developers have drunk in the Steve Jobs Kool-Aid, and they, oh, yeah. they think that they cool. figured out how Steve Jobs did it, so that's what they do. Yeah. And, and one of the things about Steve Jobs that people don't really appreciate in retrospect is he changed his mind all the time. He'd say, you know, we're never going to ship an iPod nope. that plays video, right? Uh, right. He, um, if you read his biography... But he was subtle about it. He wasn't blogging about it. Right. And if you read his biography, yeah. he was vehemently against iTunes for Windows. He said, we will never ship iTunes for Windows. We will never make iTunes for Windows. And then they made iTunes for Windows, and guess what? It, like, way outsold their Mac versions. Yeah. And I think what you, So when people... And he also had people who worked for him that did not agree with him. Right. And I think that's... I think Mark needs that more than ever right now. Um, and I also... Let's... Let's just... You know what? Let's move on from Upstart yeah. System D. System D is great. People are using it. Upstart is great. It does what it needs to do. People are using it. Upstart came along before System D. That's not a, not invented here thing by Canonical's sure. point of view. It's they needed a problem. They solved it. Red Hat saw a problem. They they needed to solve. They tried Upstart. Well, and didn't and do for it. the casual end user, and let's be honest about this, because I really don't know for for myself as an end user that sometimes uses Ubuntu, sometimes uses other distributions. Outside of having to remember which whether I'm using a System D setup or not. Do is there is there a no. reason honestly Users for me don't to care? care? No, I don't see it yet. At the Maybe end of the day, we will someday, but not at this point. It looks like another open source freak show yeah. at the end of the day, and it just I don't care. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so that's my big concern is that you know you're both right, you're both wrong. Let's move on. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. And uh, let's let's make code. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, you know, although I I I just wanted to say, um, I admire Aaron for. Being willing to sort of be the front of sure. some of this because sure. he is being attacked as people are just saying, "Oh, you just hate Ubuntu. Oh, you hate Canonical. You hate." No, all I this. don't think that's true. No, at all. I don't think that's his issue. I, I do agree that he's try his his heart's in the right place. Mm -hmm. I just I think everything that needs to be said has been said, and it's like, you know, whatever. Let's yeah. just move on. So let's talk about some new code that we all can get our hands on here Yay. pretty soon, and that is VirtualBox four yes. dot three. A couple okay. interesting things in this release. First of all, uh, if you want to play around with Windows eight one, they got support for that now, including. If you have like a multi-touch interface device, right. VirtualBox now supports multi-touch in the guest. Kind of nice. neat. That's kind of cool. Yeah, they uh, they have also uh, much. They say much improved 3D acceleration for guests, such as Fedora and other distros. Uh, they say they've significantly revamped the internals of VirtualBox right. as a platform for future performance enhancements. Today, right now, that means improved boot time for guests, but they're renovating the hypervisor all over, right. which is kind of exciting. Nice, nice IPv6 support built in. Wow. Um, they have, uh, they have a new feature that I'll show you in just a sec. 4.3 comes with built-in video capture, records mm -hmm. the contents of your guest screens to a WebM file. Whoa. Which is really neat. Yeah. That's real, uh, that could be very handy. And now also VirtualBox supports mm. the virtual webcam device that allows the pass-through of your webcam oh. into VirtualBox. Like when I need to Skype with more than one person. And that would be nice. Uh, yeah. You know, when like and sometimes mm -hmm. when you're just trying out different apps, it's like... Yeah. It's just nice. Like you want to do a Hangout in VirtualBox or something? Exactly. Or yeah. you want to test cheese out on another, distro, another distro. Yep. Sure. So uh, I will show you just real quickly here. Here is the uh, VirtualBox 4.3. I have it loaded on my Urch box. Urch. And when you go into the settings of a virtual machine and uh, you look over here at the display tab, mm -hmm. you'll see over here there's now a video capture tab. And you can turn that on and you just say where you want to save the video to. And you say what you want. the I, You know what? I want uh, 1080. Boom, right there, right? 25 frames per second. Maybe and do you I have to have your video memory 30? set to anything special for that? or It uses the host video memory. Also, it doesn't care. Yeah. Okay. So as long as you have enough. Sure, uh, sure. And then, you know, the bit rate and uh, which screen, if mm -hmm. it's got multiple screens of the VM. And then you hit right. OK. And then when the virtual machine starts up, it writes everything that happens in that virtual machine to a oh. WebM file. Now, this, to me, seems like this could be super great for, like, a tutorial on an install. Right, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, tutorials this could be huge for. And, and a lot of projects would be like, here's how you do this, and then you can just, you can just fire up a VirtualBox VM, record it, and then you could just take that WebM file, right. and dump it on the web, or throw it into a video editor and, and tweak it a little bit. That's a pretty neat feature, I think. I think it's an excellent feature. And they're, working on a lot, they're working on a lot of improvements for the guests, and uh, I'm curious to see where they go with the performance, because I think right now... In my personal experience, VMware Workstation still has the lead for performance. Still pulling a little bit ahead. But uh -huh. if they're tweaking that hypervisor, that could introduce some issues. But it's hmm. kind of neat. And uh, one last little link I wanted to give you guys, uh, just something to check out on your own after the show. Have you heard about redecentralized.org? No, I have not. Well, it's kind of a lot of what we've been talking about. 
Uh, over the last few years, we've noticed this is on their site. Quite a few people trying to spread the internet out again, back to the edges. You know, a series of individual networks right. interconnected, right? Uh, sometimes they do it for privacy. Sometimes they do it for resilience against disaster. Sometimes they do it to bring playfulness back to computers and how we use them. So, redecentralized.org is about decentralizing the internet again, sure. going back to a decentralized a internet. Old school. Yeah. And they have uh, up uh, over on their site, which we have linked, they have some interviews that they've conducted already, uh, seven of them. Uh, each with different folks who are working on projects that help decentralize the internet. That's like uh, here's uh, somebody here working on ArcOS. Mm -hmm. ArcOS makes it easy to securely self-host your websites, emails, and etc. Uh, Cryptosphere, wow. Cryptosphere, an open source P2P web application platform. Right? Nice. Zero tier, zero tier uh, creates a, a flat virtual Ethernet network of almost unlimited size. Oh, that's, this is these are very neat. powerful ideas. Yeah, so you can go watch these. These are guys that are sort of leading the uh, for forefront of re-decentralizing. I think it's a good term, That's too. That's really cool. That's at redecentralized.org. And uh, you'll notice when you watch some of those interviews that Linux is at the heart a lot oh, of Oh, I efforts. imagine so. Yeah. I imagine so. It looks like they have a subscribe feature and everything. Yeah, it is truly, Linux is truly the decentralized OS, so it makes sense for a decentralized web. Makes sense to Just me. saying, Matt. Just saying. All right, very good. That's all the news. Oh, wait, actually, but, we have wait, one more but, story. One more. Before we run, I just wanted to, I don't have a lot to say on this one, sure. but I thought it was interesting. Is TrueCryptAuditedYet.com? Oh, <laughs> boy. That's so, an attention guard. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, right now the answer is no. Uh. However, this is a fundraising project that's seen a lot. Of, they've got an Indiegogo. They're up mm. on a Bitcoin funding website. They're taking funds from their – it's actually seen quite a bit of traction. Um, and what they're trying to do is a license uh, – to review the license of the later versions of TrueCrypt to make sure that they're FOSS compatible so that way they can be uh, bundled with distros. Sure, sure. They're also trying to adopt a deterministic build process for Tor that the Tor is using oh, now for no, this is a good idea. Yeah, for uh, TrueCrypt, mm -hmm. so that way the bu they can make sure that the binaries are safe and untampered. Um, they say it's a precondition to everything, so they really need to get that right. Yeah. And they also want to pay out bug bounties. Not every developer has time uh, That's to dot it. We need more of that, yes. To give out some bounties if, 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 if people find stuff. So they're raising a ton of money right now. As of October 17th, in just one avenue, they've raised $36,000. Uh, let's go check their Indiegogo. You know, page. you could really sum up their uh, Indiegogo page with uh, "no money, no honey." You know, uh, I'm just saying. And 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 twenty eight thousand on this. Uh, wow! And yeah. I think they're going to reach it. Fifty five days left. They've already raised twenty five of twenty eight. Uh, People are really. I think you know they're this serious is, about it. Let's take advantage of the fact that TrueCrypt is open source software. Let's right? make sure it's safe and in the, all with all the latest NSA revelations. I, I think this is awesome, and and I, I believe this demonstrates to all of us why core security infrastructure code like this, like TrueCrypt. Mm -hmm needs to be open source. Agreed. We need to be able to have this kind of option. In we need to when something it was something the scope that has happened with the Snowden leaks in 2013. Oh God, isn't yes. it sort of a peace of mind to know that a lot of people have gone through the true crypt code, true crypt code and audited it and made sure it's safe. So if you want to uh, check out if it's out, not, I guarantee you that's going to be a thing. Yeah. So. And so you can check on the status they have it right up there is truecryptauditedyet.com and they have a description of the project, how you can contribute to help. They're going to if they get, if they raise enough money, they're going to hire Professional crypto analysis people who who professionally audit cryptology code and they're going to go in there and analyze it and get a complete certification yep. of uh, non tamperedness. <laughs> that would be great. And uh, yeah, and then also if all works out, we'll be able to get uh, the newer versions of TrueCrypt uh, bundled into Linux distributions. Nice. So yeah, nice. All right, Matt. That is all the news for this week. time to talk about a surprisingly powerful Linux-powered NAS that runs silently in your home. I'm really excited to talk about this, but first, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76, creators of machines born to run Ubuntu. And you know, as Ubuntu 13.10 has rolled out, System76 has been right there to make sure all of their customers need the information to upgrade. They've had right. instructions on their website, which laptops might have issues, if any, turns out none. Yeah, and right. also, they include, like, here's the repo if you want to get the latest System76 stable driver. Mm -hmm. Just add this after you upgrade. Like, really nice, easy, straightforward stuff. I ran stuff like Hybrid 8 and Suspended and whatnot. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I ran 13.10 on my Bonobo during our review. Flawless. Right? I mean, it's like, whoa. Absolutely, completely, and totally flawless. Uh, and they just rolled out a new machine. Check this out. It's the Darter Ultra Thin 14.1-inch touchscreen. Oh, and by the way, uh, plus five hours on battery life, I checked. <laughs> yeah, isn't that great? I, the first thing I went to, yep, yep there it is. So, okay. you know, uh, I've, I have I have had a little bit of envy with the Windows 8 guys who, I'm not saying I would full-time interact with my PC on the <laughs> right. touchscreen, but every now and then, it's there is something that's nice about, eh, flip that up or touch that just really quick. Sure. And as more and more things go touch, 
there's going to be folks out there that want to run Linux on their desktop but try out their touch applications. And this is going to be the perfect machine to do that. You can stay in a well-supported Linux environment. You can build those touch applications. And it looks super nice, really well done trim. Look at that nice brushed oh, metal. it's gorgeous. And nice and thin, 14.1-inch screen. Uh, HDMI out, yeah, Ethernet built in, which mm. is not all of the book, not all of laptops of this size that's have true. Ethernet. That's a big point right there. Yeah, and right now they have a special deal on five dollar ground shipping if you order uh, like before the twenty eighth, I think. That's so great. that's uh, that battery life is incredible. You know, part of that is because of Haswell, right? Right. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, this, I mean, System seventy six. They've got great laptops. Now Ten look it, at how fluid the uh, touchpad is I with know. the rest of the computer. It's just like it's just slick. flawless. Yeah, that is looking really <clears> slick. Um, and also. You know, if maybe you're not a laptop person, you just want to have, you just want to have a fantastic Linux desktop. I mean, super, super great Linux desktop. Check out their, they got a whole line from really practical, straightforward workhorse machines to total premium performance packages that are designed for to be professional oh, yeah. grade. I love the lineup. This is System 76's best lineup they've had in years. It is, this and is my a, wife's got an eye for the uh, the one uh, standalone. The there. Sable Complete. Oh yeah, yeah. She loves I know that. that Sable Complete is is She's like perfect. I'd use that. <laughs> I think Sable Complete would be really great in office mm -hmm. spaces too. Yes, very yeah. aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, and of course they've got great great support to back it up too. Right. So you're never left out in the cold. Go over to System76.com. Get yourself something great and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. You know, if you want to jump around with different distros, you want to try different things, there is such a peace of mind knowing that the hardware in your laptop is supported. Right. You know, when I try out Arch or OpenSUSE or Fedora or Ubuntu, I love the fact that I never have to worry, is it going to work on my laptop? Or is my Wi-Fi going to work? That's a big one. That's especially with laptops. Yeah, That's yeah. the, you know, am I going to do the broad, Broadcom yeah. dance or not? If you're, you still, if you're yeah. still struggling with Wi-Fi, you're yeah. doing it wrong. That's Go right. over to System76 and just get it taken care That's of. That's right. So I got sent the Synology mm. uh, DS412 Plus for review. I've, I've made public some of my storage issues yeah, on right. the air. And right now, uh, this is essentially going up against a free NAS appliance that I have from uh, IX Systems, which oh, okay. I, I really like a lot. And you guys know So I'm you're a, able to kind of compare these. Yeah. I'm a pretty big ZFS fan, too. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'll be honest, was wearing a little bit of my skeptical pants when right. this arrived on my door because <laughs> I thought, you know, I want a man's NAS. You can't put... And the, enough horsepower right. and performance for what I need in, in an appliance box like this. That's a big, tall order. Right? It really is. Uh, so uh, the Synology disk station, uh, this one that came configured with four, four terabyte drives, Ooh, um, uh, Western Digital bad. Reds, which is wow. how I that's, roll these that's days. That's how you want. Yeah. And uh, it's, I, I, if you're watching the video version, I'm showing you some product pictures of it. And uh, you don't get a good sense of how big it is. It's, it's smaller than you'd think. So uh, I took some video of it before the show and uh, kind of give you, kind of give you like a, a visual overview of what it looks like now. Inside this machine is a uh, uh, is Linux kernel 3.2.40. It's okay. got uh, one gigabyte of DDR3 RAM, nice. and it has a quad core, I believe. Uh, it looks like it based on a proc info. Uh, uh, Intel Atom D2701 running at 2.1 gigahertz. Okay, so low power consumption, but you got decent cooling. Yeah, uh, you yeah. got hot swappable. Drives. You got hot swappable yeah. drives. Um, your theoretical max, if you do link aggregation, because it has two gigabit Ethernet ports, is 205 megabytes a second reading, 182 megabytes a second writing. With one Ethernet port, I'm getting about 90 megabytes, 95 mm. megabytes a second, which is still great. On the back, it has USB 3, it has eSATA, like I mentioned, two LAN ports for aggregating if you want, or you can just use one. It's got passive CPU cooling, it's got the Atom processor in there. Uh, it has uh, support for uh, Active Directory and Windows ACLs if you have Windows clients. It has iSCSI support, so you can do uh, virtualized servers on it. And uh, it also has uh, 40, it only uses 44 watts. Let me play it again so you can, you can eyeball it. It only uses 44 watts of power in standard operation, right? So Gosh. compare that to my current unit, which is using quite a bit more. It's a full-fledged PC. And of so course, immediately you see a power consumption difference there as far as what's being used. I mean, that's kind of nice. If you pause it here, so uh, if you see here, there's it's got two Ethernet ports. There's the power port, and then mm -hmm. my finger's right now covering up the eSATA port. Well, and I like how everything's centralized to one side versus being spread out through the entire back, which is kind of nice when you're trying to do cord management. And mm -hmm. you see those those big fans? Oh, yes. First big of all, uh, they run at minimal speeds, so that way they they, just, mm -hmm. they move enough air, and that there's, there's temperature sensors in the unit that gives you a readout of your temperature sure. status. If one of those fans fails... The other fan can detect that and then pick up to make up for the lost cooling. Oh, nice. It's like RAID for your fans, right? And, and they cool. are user serviceable. You just pop wow. them off from the back. You can contact Synology, mm -hmm. and they'll send you a new one, which is pretty nice. Uh, it, so as far as networking protocols, mm -hmm. it supports a SIFS, AFP, FTP, iSCSI, Telnet, SSH, NFS, NMP, WebDAV, and, of course, CalDAV. Why not, right? 
And uh, it, the file system on the hard drives is ext4. It supports external ext3 FAT and TFS drives. So it's using wow. ext4 on the actual drives. That was very appealing to me because I like the idea that in an emergency, I could pop one of those out and any Linux box could be Yeah, right. Them. Just bam, done. So mm. uh, it also uses something called Synology Hybrid Rate, okay. which allows you, in the right conditions, to add drives of different sizes and expand an existing array. Oh, So really? sort of like that Drobo-like yeah. functionality where you can say, all right, well, I want to start out with two four-terabyte drives. Mm -hmm. I'll leave two slots open, and then I'm going to add you know, more drives. It supports maximum four terabytes okay. uh, each. And then, of course, it has eSATA and USB 3, so you could do external storage. So that's nice. the basics of the machine there. But I knew all that when they sent it to me. Sure. Um, because I've followed Synology a little bit because I've considered them for some of my clients before. What I had not seen until I'd actually gotten my hands on a Synology box is actually how you administer a Synology server. So Which is gorgeous. I mean, it's just a really good Yeah, desktop. here it is right here. This is the uh, this mm. is the Synology admin UI. And uh, I'm, let me frame it for the camera. It is a surprisingly easy to use. You could throw this in the hand of pretty much any Windows user. Because it has a very standard desktop-like interface, mm -hmm. paradigm. It's got a start menu-like thing where a lot of oh. your control is done at. So let me walk you through wow. this a little bit. So you have a lot of options here. First mm -hmm. of all, the storage manager. Let's mm -hmm. go into the let's go into the deets first. Okay. This is where you set up your drives. You can see here I have one volume. You see my four drives running. Uh, the three point six four is the usable. Sure. Uh, combined together, that gives them a ten terabyte capacity. It's using a Synology hybrid RAID, so I can I can withstand one drive failure, but I can also add additional drives to this existing established oh, volume. Oh, so you can go back or forth on it. That's yep. kind of nice. I can mm -hmm. see if the status of each drive and which one has a problem. I can go in here and I can specifically manage certain hard drives. I get their individual temperature status. I can pull up uh, information about them. I can run smart tests on them. I can schedule sector tests oh. from here. I can set up my iSCSI LUNs or targets here. I can enable a hot spare. And if I want to, if I want to use one of the slots, mm -hmm. now you have to give up one of your four slots. Four. But if I want to, I can also install an SSD cache, oh, no which kidding. will give me even more of a performance boost. Now, remind you, hmm. I'm using four drives in their hybrid rate. I'm getting, on average, about 95 megabytes a second when sure. I write to it. That, for me, is about the, as good as you're going to get on a single Ethernet yeah. connection. So that's, that's pretty good. And what really gets crazy about this thing is when you want to go in and set up some of your uh, some of your file shares and things like that, you bring up the control panel. Crazy easy. Now, I'm, this isn't Flash. I, yeah, that's what I like about it. This is isn't Flash. very, very clean. I'm just using Chrome. It works in Firefox. It wow. works in Safari. It works in everything. You go into your uh, file sharing. Just enable Windows file sharing. Enable SMB2. Enable local master browser. Click, click, click. You're done. Mac file. Enable Mac file services. Enable Bonjour printer broadcasting. Wow. NFS. You just check that NFS box, mm. and now you have NFS. I mean, it is very, you jump in, you jump out, setting up your users, extremely straightforward. You fill in the information. You can set up uh, notifications God, via great. email. Oh, yeah. It's like using OpenSUSE. It's like jumping into Yast and setting things up. I love that. And keep in mind these these user accounts, because those are going to mm -hmm. come back here in a, in a little bit. Also, you can tie into LDAP or an Active Directory, so you can join a domain from right here. Right. So you can, instead of using local accounts, you could use that. You can set up QoS. Um, oh. All the MIDI indexing, VPN, you can actually support uh, being a VPN endpoint. Oh, no kidding. Also has a built-in software updater, so you can go out and pull down the latest updates. That from, oh, I like In fact, lot. it looks like I have an update available. Oh. Uh, so real easy to use. And again, you're not loading any software on right. your machine. You're just visiting this in a web page. And you notice, too, at the same time, over on the right-hand side, I have a real-time system status. I have my health, I have my CPU, my RAM, and my network transfer rate. Down here in the recent logs, this includes oh, this is nice. people who have logged in, people who have right. connected to the machine recently via one of the file services. So I can see here's a Windows file, here's a here's an Apple file service. Connection. Well, and I like how everything's at a glance. You don't necessarily have to dive into all the deep stuff immediately. You can look at your general health on that control panel and get the general idea of what's going on just yeah. looking at it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and I've left it up for for a whole day while I was like copying files to it and yeah. you know just used it to see what my transfer rates were at. Uh, it has a built-in notification tray, so you can see when I hooked nice. up the eSATA disk, I get a little notification here saying, "Hey," huh. you're, and I can actually eject. That oh, device. no kidding! Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, here's right. my here's my user uh, control panel. I can mm -hmm. search the device for files that are on the device, uh, and then this is where it got crazy. Now, remember, this is Linux. Sure. It's, it's running an Atom processor, mm -hmm. so if it runs on an x86 Linux box, it could, in theory, run on this. Well, they've included what they're calling a package center. Oh, no way. It's like an no app way. store oh, dude, for the Synology. Awesome. Nice. So I have a couple installed. Okay. Um, the ones I installed are Glacier Backup. This this Good. backs up your Synology to Glacier. Amazon okay. Glacier is Amazon's. It's like S3 only for long-term storage. It's a little cheaper. Sure. 
And uh, so you can just you can just go in here and add it, and then you pair it with your Amazon account, and then now now the Synology itself will directly back up to Amazon Glacier, kind of like Jungle Disk, only using the the, the more modern Amazon uh, storage system that's meant for actual backup. Wow. Um, I had a photo station, which I'll demo that in a minute. But mm-hmm. there's a bunch of other really awesome apps that I was really surprised. Asterix is in here. XBMC. DocuWiki. Uh, Plex Media Server. Oh, see, that's what I was going so for. So this thing oh, could be a dude. Plex Media Server directly. Oh, seriously. Uh, a Syslog Server. Wow. Time Machine Support. Tomcat Web Server. Station. Dude, do you oh. see that? Where's the surveillance? Oh yeah, so you got it. Oh yeah, seriously, guys. So, so check oh out the God, surveillance. Cool. Look at this. Look oh. at this. You get you get audio oh, levels for your cameras. Man. You get you get a time log, and all of this is being recorded to the Synology itself. You also get camera motion controls. You can move oh, the camera man. around, and again, all being written to your Synology mm. NAS, right? Mm. And it includes a. I think I don't know about Android, but they have an iOS app to right, also sure. view it. Um, multimedia. You can also be an iTunes man. server. Um, under business, this you know, is really open cool. ERPs WordPress? on here. Wow, uh, Moodle's on here. Sugar CRM, you can install on this. A mail server, you can install Media Wiki. Well, between the Wiki, the uh, CRM apps, and then the mail, I mean, it's like you're you're like small business ready right there. <laughs> PHP awesome. My Admin, DNS wow. server, uh, DHCP server. I mean, the list goes wow. on, right? It's pretty impressive stuff they have in here. So I thought I'd demo you a couple of them that yeah. I have. So just like you would expect, once you have an app installed. Mm-hmm. It goes into this start menu like tray. So you see here, I have sense. Glacier Backup, so mm-hmm. I can load the. This is the Glacier Backup uh, program, and I can set up my backups and mm-hmm. restore from here and view my log and all that kind of stuff. Very and clean. What's very nice about it is it just runs right on the on the Synology NAS itself. I don't oh, have to have an external great. program doing this. And here is the Photo Station. Now the Photo Station is really really cool. It, as you might expect, allows oh. you to take the photos that are on your NAS and give you a web UI to present them. And uh, you get you get a very good you get a very good UI to look at your pictures. You can share to social websites from here. Uh, you can share to like Facebook or oh, Google Plus cool. or Twitter. So you can do the album or the individual photos. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you can go in and so like um, you can you can also do you can, so, uh, so, oh like here's this great uh, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, beer butt tur- uh, chicken that I was making right. Yeah. Over on the side, you get uh, you get your uh, um, XF info. Like you can see, I took it on my HTC One. You can see what the f-stop was. It gives you all. Wow. If I had a GPS tag in there, you'd see it. So sure. all that's in there. It's just a really nice way to view those to view those pictures. God, that's great. But it gets even better. Oh no, seriously! I you was had surprised. The surveillance stuff and all that. I know, right? That's I know. awesome. It's like, oh my god. They also have a series of Synology mm-hmm. Android apps mm-hmm. that work in tandem with these. On your Android device. So here is wow. one of them. Here is the uh, Synology Photo app. Right. This ties in with that Photo Station program. So using this app, I can view all of the photos that are in my Photo Station, and I can upload photos from my phone to the Photo Station. Now, when you set this app up, what's the configuration like as far as being uh, off your land? I mean, like, mm-hmm. how's that work? Um, you would have to have. Uh, so see, you can see here. I just logged out, so you can see it. Okay. You have to have either what they call a quick connect ID, which maybe is like through their service, or you'd okay. have to have your IP exposed. So you have the option of either or. If you're not comfortable yeah. exposing your IP, you can perhaps do it through them. And it does SSL. Oh, so see, that's, that's important. Yep. Either way. So this is so you can take this photo station, which is on the Synology NAS, and you can manage it from your Android app. Mm-hmm. You can so if you knew you had photos on there you wanted to show somebody, you could retrieve them that way. Or if you knew you just took a great photo and you wanted to upload it to your Synology NAS, you could do it that way. Now it gets even better. There's also an app that connects over WebDAV that lets you just access all of the files on the Synology NAS nice. from your Android smartphone. Very so box. I have right here uh, one of my my video folders, mm-hmm. and uh, I have here's Back to the Future. It's an MKV rip, right? Okay. And if I if I tap on it, it opens it up and says, "Well, just like in any other Android yeah. program, what program in Android do you want to use to watch this?" I can uh, I can choose whichever. I have several apps that are capable of playing sure. MKV files on my Android phone, so I tell it which one I want. And within a few seconds, over WebDAV, it that app goes out, connects to that MKV file, and now I am streaming Back to the Future in high definition on my HTC One oh, from my Synology NAS. It's like a yeah, it's like Flex see, there's there. the there's the hoverboard. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is surprisingly easy. And once you put in the address of it, it can, and there's several other apps that do sure. this. Um, they also, which I didn't bother installing, they have a Synology download manager that downloads torrents, FTP links, and Usenet files. And they have an Android app that lets you manage the download manager that's running on the Synology server. Oh, I like the control. So yeah. it's, so this is multiple applications you can install on your Android phone right. to do multiple purposes. Yeah, okay. And uh, so I, I, I kind of went light cool. because I have Linux boxes that sit in front of my NAS server. They connect over NFS, and they yeah. do a lot of this stuff. And I, I realized as I was kind of working on this is 
if if I didn't have high, if I didn't have as stringent production demands, I really think that a lot of the stuff like running Plex, oh, running yeah. a photo server, running in your case like a security monitoring yeah. server, a lot of that could run on the Synology station. I don't have to have a dedicated. I server wouldn't. To do yeah, that. I wouldn't necessarily run them both at the same time, but I think just as an either or situation, absolutely. At the end of the day, the thing that really impressed me about uh, the Synology was, is they're not totally hiding the Linux from you. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just check a box, turn on SSH, and then log in, and you have right here, uh, it's BusyBox, but this is my Synology station. There's not a lot going on right now. But, uh, sure. you know, this is the Synology server, and I, I, this, is, this is how I transferred the data, is I logged in, did an NFS mount to my existing free NAS server, mm -hmm. and then just used rsync to move all the data over right on the command line. Boom. And I had all the command line tools I expected to have, like rsync and top and all that mm -hmm. stuff, Right here on a Linux box, running kernel 3, what did I say, 3240? Yeah. So it knew enough. Knew enough and for what you need. It's stable. I can see all the processes on here. So I, I understand how this works. It is, it doesn't treat you like you're stupid. It gives you enough control, but it can be easy yeah, if you want it to be. Exactly. It's like yeah. this perfect balance of total easy to use mm -hmm. UI, great performance. I mean, we're talking 95 megabytes yeah. a second. Not megabits, but megabytes yeah, that's, a that's second. That's decent. Yeah. Uh, with uh, built-in support for iSCSI, so when I build my Proxmox server, I can point it right at this thing. Wow. It's gonna be, it's, it's, I, I'm pretty impressed. In fact, I'm so impressed that I think I'm going to tell them I want to keep it, and I'm going to pay full price for it. Wow, yeah. And I'll move off of my FreeNAS installation to this. And that's, you know, having my storage be based on BSD was kind of like, oh, I'm a host Linux action show, and I'm using a BSD server. <laughs> right, yeah, right. And part of it was because I was being a ZFS bigot. But with with their hybrid RAID technology, and uh, and and the... and the pluses of running Linux, it, it kind of, to me, works out to be a net positive. Well, and you're getting the experience that you want, the collective overall general experience that you're looking for, not just based on this one individual technology, but the fact that the general experience is, in fact, really good. Yeah, I look at this UI, right? Like, how great is that? Awesome. It's so clean. It, and it's very, um, I thought, oh, running something like this is going to have to put a ton of load on the box. Cause, you you know, would think, right? Yeah. I was pounding it. when I was I was copying over terabytes and terabytes worth of data, I was streaming stuff from it. I was really trying out a whole bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. and it, it held it held solid. In fact, it's got a really nice resource monitor program in here where you go in here, you get your CPU, your memory utilization. You Dang. can look at the disk load. You can you can if you have iSCSI, it'll, give, it'll break that out for you. It gives you your network load. It charts it all out for you. It, here's the processes. Uh, oh, that's current, helpful. Current connections. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I can drop somebody. I can kill a connection. That's cool too. Because, you know, let's say someone in the house needs to be dropped for whatever reason. Yeah. Maybe maybe you're waiting for them to do something or they need to go do a chore or something. Bam, done. The other really nice hmm. thing is is it it solves a lot of problems folks have when they're running a Samba server at home. Yes. Like, you have weird permission issues. They've really, they've ironed all of that out. Um, and I'll give you an example. Like, you can go on to a share on this Synology box from a Windows client, and you can right-click on a folder in that share, and mm -hmm. you can actually use the NT permissions dialog to set the permissions on the Samba server, and it translates those to the permissions that are supposed to be on the server. So Windows wow. users who have used Windows all their life, who expect that kind of functionality, you know, you have to go through the trouble on the Samba box of setting all that yes. up, and then you got to make sure your creation masks are, are set properly, that way new files are created. This, this handles all of that. And it really sits in that sweet spot between advanced but yet easy enough to use. And... So if you value your time, this is something you yeah. really consider. And, and and if you want performance, yes. And 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 for me, I love the idea of that of that hybrid RAID. So I'm considering taking that um, external array, the drives for Jupyter yeah. array that we got, and plugging that into this. Oh right. And then and adding that to the storage pool, and <gasps> Dude, then I'll just say awesome. I'll take that. I have I have ideas to repurpose that free NAS box yeah. into a, a Proxmox server, oh. and I'll hang it off of this. And then I have two Linux servers. I'm going to combine them onto the Proxmox servers, shut those things down. Mm -hmm. This thing only pulls 44 watts, and it has intel intelligent power management, so it'll spin the fans down if it doesn't need them. It can spin the drives down if they haven't been accessed for a certain amount of time. That's that's good for the life of the drive. Yeah, and then and then um, and then I'll have I'll have a Proxmox box sitting in front of it doing some of the more advanced, fancy features that I want. But the solid performance of this thing, and and because it is kind of simple, the design is kind of simple. Mm -hmm. It's pretty straightforward, and and when you and you know like. The 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 whole like uh, it gives you like individual drive temperatures mm -hmm. and health. So I really like I've had problems with drives dying on me and then and I not go to, knowing why or seeing the warning signs. Or even this is going to take care. Or of even like in the in the case of the free NAS server, sometimes right. I don't even know which drive. Oh right, like I just it's know, not identified as a specific drive. It's just identified. Hey, you're having problems. Yeah, yeah. drive eighty o one is having problems, and I'm what like, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, yeah. which drive is is eighty o one in this yeah. whole list here? And and you know, it's kind of like this 
I, and what I've literally had to do in, in FreeNAS is I pull a drive and I wait to see drive 8002 was removed. Okay, that's not the right drive. I put oh, it back in. I pull yeah. the next drive, 8003 is, right. okay, that's not the right drive. But this addresses that. This gives you. Each uh, drive has yeah. been numbered in the chassis. And then in the UI, it correlates all of the health information to that specific drive. Mm. So now uh, I know, okay, drive three is specifically having an issue. Go pull drive three. And then you add drive three and automatically rebuilds the array. And, and I kind of, ZFS might be my preference, but at the same time, ext4 is a tried and true file system. It has fantastic performance. Sure. And I intimately know how to work with it. And I know how to take it, hook it up to my Bonobo through the eSATA port, and maybe pull something off of it. So I'm a little more comfortable uh, with ext4 plus i'm a little more comfortable with the fact that it's linux too sure. absolutely um and so there you go so if you're watching the video version you kind of see how the drive slides in and slides out real super easy to use it just snaps right in it comes with a little tray that's really easy to install them mm. and uh, i i have i've had it running next to me like while we were doing uh linux unplugged and it's silent that's a big thing right there especially in a studio environment yeah yeah absolutely Yeesh. so uh that's the disk station from synology this is the ds 412. Oh, I should probably, you know, they sent this was a review unit, so I didn't actually look at the price. The price, it starts, the course, with all this kind of stuff. There's a few ways you can buy it, right? You can buy it right. empty. <laughs> yeah, right. With yeah. no and drives. Do, and which, uh, for me, I would just want the drives included. Yeah, and then if you want the drives included, on Amazon, the unit itself is 600 bones. But it's Ooh. it's a full-fledged PC. But you're getting a lot, I mean, as I say, you're getting a lot of value yeah. for it. And then if you, if you go, like, with their 12-terabyte 12 12 terabyte bundled, which comes with reds, mm -hmm. uh, it gets up to 1,500. See, for me... I already have the drive. If I didn't have the drives from Jupiter's, then I would probably not be able to make the switch. Oh, because yeah. Because I already have the That'd drives. That'd be 1,500 bones. Yeah. yeah, I already have the drives. So $600 for me, because I'm going to use it in my business, I'm going to yeah. use it constantly. I mean, I really use the hell out of our disk storage. It's totally worth it. The value it. weighs in. Yeah. Totally. And, and plus, I want to repurpose that FreeNAS box as a Proxmox server. I've been wanting to do that for a while, so this gives me an opportunity to do that. And you can see here's the packaging. It's pretty minimal. Yeah, they did a nice job. And the icon set is very reflective of the experience that you get in the web GUI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's got, yeah, they're the same icon, so it's very mm -hmm. all tied together. Yeah. It's got a lot of backup programs I didn't dig into. There's not, you know, not just right. not just backing up the unit itself. It's also got sync programs to sync with your desktop program. They mm -hmm. list Ubuntu 9 and, and later as supported. Uh, and it's got uh, it's got uh, features to uh, do like imaging. It's got features to back up oh, Macs using Time Love Machine. It. Love it. Lots of stuff in there. Uh, but for me, the core things came down to Linux powered, x86 based. That for me is important. Yeah. And uh, Linux uh, um, fast performance. Very Linux fast. and x86 and take a licking and keep on ticking. So that is the Synology box. And uh, I say, if you're in the market, pick one up. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Hey, Matt. Yes. Before we go, should we read some emails? Oh yeah. You know, I, I just wanted. to couple of quick things, follow-ups. Uh, I, I think I said this in the review, but um, you know, I, I, I have done a 180. When that Synology arrived at my house, I thought, this is a toy, right? Because I've worked That's in your initial impression without having tried it yet, sure. Matt, you should see some of the data centers where, where I've worked with the, the store. Like, we've had racks and racks and racks of storage. And yeah. It, like, that wasn't enough. So when I, wow. saw, when I saw this little box show up, I thought, there's no way. It's adorable. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's a cute toy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll play with the toy, and then I'll send it back. Right, right sure. I was... I did a 180. I was pretty impressed. And I just wanted to say we'll have a link to it in the show notes. If you pick that up using the link in the show notes, you'll support the show. And because it's a high-ticket item, we'll get a nice cut from that. So nice. we appreciate that. Uh, all right, Matt. Here's our first email. It came from Sam. And okay. Sam says he wants to know about Linux for the older generations. He says, hi, Chris and Matt. With the end of support for Windows XP coming about, my father is trying to decide which OS to move to. He's well aware that Microsoft has long been a sinking ship and is quite prepared <laughs> to hop on the Linux bandwagon. However... He is very old-fashioned, liking things simple and stable. Uh, why he never upgraded past XP, by the way. His memory is taking a hit, and as he gets older, and although he is very technical cap technically capable, he is worried that he will never fully familiarize with Linux and things won't, quote-unquote, stick. He doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to be a pain by asking me questions all the time, and likewise, I don't want him to be trying to do his own banking one day and get stuck, and I'm not contactable. Simple is better. Mm -hmm. So, with your wide experiences of many distros, which would you say is the most suited for the older generation? Most people would say Ubuntu, but I have not been a fan of Canonical lately. Thanks for making a great show, Sam. Uh, so here's the deal. First and foremost, above, above, uh, above anything, is you want an ability to remote into his desktop. Uh, keeping in mind, I used to run a PC repair business, and when I exited that PC repair business, I actually migrated half my customer base over to Linux, so I didn't have to deal with it anymore. Um, and it worked out really well, actually. 
um, and then set them up with someone else to take over after that. So based on that, I have some experience in this, and I would say you're going to want a desktop experience either based on Debian or, I hate to say it, probably Ubuntu, that is going to allow you to do that. Now, that being said, you don't want to use Unity. That I tr Google, Chris Perillo's dad tries to use Ubuntu, and you'll understand why. It doesn't work. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want something like S XFCE, probably, something simple. Hmm. Uh, what he's using, everything needs to be on the desktop, uh, browser, preferably email browser. Uh, the bookmarks need to be actually below the address bar itself so that everything's readily accessible. What about, what about so, uh, Linux Mint yeah. with Cinnamon? Because Cinnamon's get, kind um, of a lot like check XP. Check it for stability because Linux Mint's hit and miss. Yeah, I would say Linux Mint's a good choice. Make sure it's stable before you yeah, actually uh, yeah. release it. And make sure you can remote in. Hey, what about, do so. you remember when we reviewed Zorin OS? And Zorin's you remember, not a bad option. Well, one of the things about Zorin was that it had like this menu you could bring up and say, oh. Yeah. What UI do you want us to be like? And one of the options was you could choose XP, and then oh, it would yeah. it would kind of set up an XP yeah. theme. And that is a Ubuntu based, right? I th yeah, yeah. If it, it was, is, then as long as it's you like twelve oh four based, I think. As long as you can get a remote app in there to where you can remote in, because you're gonna yeah, still have is. that happen. Um, and I forget what was the. See, app look at this right on. here. So you got Windows Seven, Windows oh, XP, Windows yeah. two thousand, and God, you click great. that, and it uses the menu, and you have the the browser chooser too. Whoa! Yeah, right. This was this is probably there you go. This probably is. And Zorin OS, like you said, it's Ubuntu based, so that's yeah. going to solve some of the software compatibility. That would be a good thing. good approach. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I go with Zorin OS and just make it, just keep it simple. Less is more. And yeah. then what? Maybe Splash Top for remote access. Splash Top would be yeah, that's what I would do, just because it's minimal. Uh, they can you can just leave it running in the background. Yeah. You know, or for uh, most people. or uh, or uh, Chrome the Chrome remote desktop works Chrome's under Linux not too. Bad. Yeah, yeah, that's not bad. Either, yeah, either one would work okay. Something to where he doesn't have to worry about forwarding ports or any of that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, so, no kidding. Because I've been through that. Splash Top yeah. might be easier. On on you as the supportee, it would, and it yeah. works really, really well. It's stable. It's not going to uh, do and any it, weird. If stuff. you're out and about, you could at least pull up his screen on your mm -hmm. smartphone and at least see what he's talking about. Absolutely, right? that's the nice thing there about you know because common instances is uh, maybe they're wanting to use bill payer with banking or stuff like that. These are things you really need to just sometimes be there to actually see what they're seeing, and so it's a uh, it's it's helpful. Yeah, they so. call it the look changer, I li and I like that name because it's 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 exactly so what here it is so here's the yeah. XP look here. I'm pulling it. Oh wow. They oh, even do crap. the XP style menu. Look at Dude, that, where they have the, the. This is. I'm gonna have to look into this more seriously for some folks, actually. Yeah, That's I remember really when we looked good. at this. I remember you and I said this was like the Windows switcher, yeah. the Windows salvation. They have a Windows Seven. I mean, it's style not for too. me as a power user, but yeah. I think for just Joe Average, that just yeah. Right? And here's the Windows 2000 look, which is uh, uh, <laughs> because I mean there are other things. Yeah, sure, you could go Made or Cinnamon or whatever, but I think actually identifying with something they're familiar with more heavily is going to save you some hassle if you're the support guy. OS Zorin OS. Wow. Check it out. Seriously. All right. So oh. Noah writes in. Noah writes in. He wants to take okay. the Linux community to task. He says, you're missing the point with Ubuntu. I normally don't comment about this stuff, but the Ubuntu hate has me all wound up. Okay. Yes, Ubuntu has its problems, but I think we're all missing the point. First, mobile on the desktop is not the issue. Okay. Uh, what you, meaning the Linux community, are missing is that Ubuntu is a general purpose distro, and it always has been. The only difference is the shift in the meaning of the general purpose. You are power users that need powerful machines, but most users are using tablets and phones because they play mindless games and browse the net. <laughs> that brings me to my second point. I think he's kind of... I, I wonder if that's actually true. I wonder if the yeah. majority of computer users like outside of techies are just people in a, at an office Depends desk. on the generational. Um, I'd say uh, 40 and under, yes. I'd say 50 and over, probably still desktops and laptops. Um, and at then, the, of course, pe and at home. Yeah, at yeah. home. Not, not in business, but at home. Yeah. Um, that's been my experience. Uh, I know entire households that are reasonably tech savvy that have not, they don't have a single laptop or otherwise. You know, I feel like we've so, been, you know. I, I feel like a certain portion out there is branded as Ubuntu haters when both, the, I, I, before the, before the show on the live stream, yeah. our Ubuntu 1310 review was playing mm -hmm. and we had a lot of good things to say. Yeah, we did. I, I, cause I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't suck. It actually is usable. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I think, what needs to do. I think people need to reconsider that. We're not Ubuntu haters. We're no. just. We're just. I run Ubuntu as a secondary computer. Yeah, we have. I have so, several Ubuntu machines yeah, in the house. So, so it's just like, saying, you know, you got We just we're just asking critical yeah. questions. Didn't like it. I wouldn't use it. So this brings them to a second point: the scopes. Sure. The general population can barely distinguish local and cloud services. Smart scopes and the relay of information to Canonical may bother you, but it's meaningless to the average user. That uh, that last part I agree with. I, I it does bother me, and it is meaningless to the average user because I mean, God, look what they do already. Yeah, so. I would argue though <laughs> that. Um, Outside of all the privacy stuff, yeah. um, it's also a bad implementation that delivers poor results that that's, generally... That's the part the user might care about. It's yeah. generally underwhelming. So yeah. I think most people just won't use it. That's, uh, yeah, that's probably what's going to happen. 
It says, not to mention, you you are quick to have Android take some of that information without so much of a fuss, which... Uh, me more than Chris. Chris is actually quite critical of it. I'm not. I, I, I'm i pretty lackadaisical about it. But you've actually voiced some yeah. concerns yeah. about, hey, I'm not cool with this. Yeah. You know, so. It says, that brings me to my final point. We are no longer competing with Microsoft, and True. those that continue to do so will die on that sinking ship. I... I that's funny. Yeah. Both emails called Microsoft a sinking ship. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I do agree with that. I think focusing yeah. on Microsoft is placing the energy on in the wrong spot. Agreed. He said, Android Agreed. is now the most popular OS on the planet, and this is our new arch enemy. This can be seen with Ubuntu entrance into mobile as well as GNOME Shell and Plasma Active. Every year, someone will write an article about Linux, is how it's behind other platforms, yet when one company makes efforts to play on the same field, you chastise them for breaking away from the cluster fudge that is the Linux desktop. Ubuntu has brought more eyes to Linux than any distro, and maybe, just maybe, they're hmm. crazy enough to make it work. Uh, I think that I agree with them bringing more eyes to the desktop. I don't know how their long game is going to turn out. I have concerns. Um, there was a time there were other distributions, Xandros, Linspire, amongst a couple of other mm -hmm. ones that are lesser known that tried the same thing that people said the same thing about. It's easy to make a mistake that can really sink a ship, and so I think it's still too early to say for sure. Yeah, I... You know, I don't um, know. I hope... I really hope they're successful. I do. As I read but, this, I, 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 I see some... I definitely see some points he's making here. I think, um, yeah. too, oh, no, what it comes down well to written. is execution. Yeah. And I and I think it was really well thought out. I You know, there's some stuff I take issue with, but overall, I think the the uh, general consensus of the email itself is pretty spot on. Mm -hmm. We've had some people asking us to review Ubuntu Touch 1.0. I think mm. we'll wait. Um, give it a little more time in the yeah. oven so we can give a... Because I don't want to just rip on it. Oh, yeah. my God. I want to I actually show off the things I, they're trying Ubuntu to do. Ubuntu Touch you know? 1.0 did ship the last, yeah. that last week with 13.10, and uh, it's definitely at a spot now where developers should be digging into it. I don't know if it's really at a spot where... Critical review should be there. You go. You know, yeah. it just, it, even it, it even calling it alpha doesn't seem fair because yeah. I want to give it more time in the oven. I mean, we could we could totally do a tech demo at some point. Oh, uh, totally. Yeah, like with absolutely no opinion on performance, just like here's some things they're doing. This but is we've cool. done that. Yeah, we did we look have, at it a while did, ago. Yeah, we did kind of. Yeah, yeah. Need some stuff on it first. But uh, with you know, with all of this stuff, I kind of just like to sit back and uh, see. The thing is, is Linux will not will not die. From one from one popular distro going off on their own on their own tangent and trying something, nope. and there is more to be gained by watching what happens there and observing and right. and taking what works and applying it to the rest of the community mm -hmm. and discarding what doesn't work. And in the long run, I'm talking like the five year perspective here. Mm -hmm. It it seems impossible now, but it's going to make Linux stronger. It's going to make open source offerings better. It will. Um, and maybe they'll be wildly successful with it, and maybe they won't. In the in the in the grand picture, Linux is uh, in the really grand picture. Linux is already won, because companies do not last forever, right? Microsoft will not; they're already losing their dominance. Yeah, Davy um, ships that re once ran Windows are now running Linux and doing so and, with gusto. And eight so. one doesn't solve this. No, uh, nine probably won't either, right? Windows nine probably no. won't either. Uh, we've all seen the rumors that Apple might switch to an ARM based laptop. That if they jettisoned Intel com compatibility. Uh, that would be devastating for Apple's market share. I'm waiting desktop. for Microsoft BSD. I, something, my, I've been saying it for years, and I've been right about the stuff for the most part. They did I, have, you know, they had they, a Unix-based OS well, a they, long, long time ago. Bill Gates actually talked up BSD at one point. So yeah. I know he's not. I yeah. know that the company isn't totally adverse to the idea, and I think it'd be interesting to see if they do that. There's, <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing that canonical, canonical can do to to break the laws of physics. Man. Eventually, Linux has taken over. The phone, yeah. it's taken over the networking space. It's essentially, like Linus said in an interview, Linux is dominating every single general computing platform except for the desktop. Yep. And that is not because it never will. That's just because there's been other offerings that for a lot of people were better alternatives for various reasons. Those eventually, those reasons will begin to diminish. They already are diminishing. We're watching it happen. We're watching the collapse of the standard desktop monopoly. The general computing platform, which has dominated every other computing platform, cloud, mobile, et cetera, mm -hmm. networking gear, et cetera, will eventually dominate the desktop. It is, it's almost, it's a matter of physics. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's, a, it's like an expanding universe. Eventually it'll get there. Just Certain wait on things the right slow steward. it down maybe, yeah. Yeah. but it's going in that direction. Well, I think it will we have happen. different stewards to go different directions with it. We're just yeah. waiting on the right steward to take it the direction it needs to go. It's, it's like watching, it, it'd be like going back and watching the early Neanderthals and things like that yeah, and critiquing right. the evolution of the Neanderthal when not having any idea what they'd eventually <laughs> develop into, right? That's a very good point. It, yeah. it, open source is, for better or for worse, is very organic in its, in its nature. And sometimes, you know, the, the beast goes off in a different direction mm -hmm. and, then, and then eventually... Evolution corrects that path, and we when we move back to the right. correct direction. It's well, basically, open source is a bunch of a, a bunch of very 
passionate, loud little monkey people in a maze. And they're going to kill each other going throughout the whole maze, but eventually they're going to get to the end of that mm-hmm. maze. They're just going to be some blood and fur, Open source you know. is made of people, Matt. As we've definitely... Monkeys! <laughs> yeah, as we've definitely discovered, sometimes those monkeys fling poo, and sometimes they make a incredible You're looking at code. the big monkey right here. <laughs> you know, I, 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 when it comes to flinging poo, I am your master. <laughs> Well, uh, Matt, is there anywhere you want to send people throughout the week uh, between shows? Well, I'd be sending you there, but I definitely <laughs> not. Yeah, Ooh. but uh, yeah, you can definitely check out the uh, check out uh, Matt Hartley Public at Facebook, so you can check that out. Very and good. for now, that's, that's probably your best bet. There's some stuff coming, not quite ready yet. Of course, also you got to check out one of the greatest Linux oh, podcasts right? on yeah, the planet, Linux Unplugged. Linux Hello. Unplugged yeah. every Tuesday over JupiterBroadcasting dot com. Episode ten, ten weeks in a row, Matt. Yes. Just popped, and people are loving the Unplugged, so if you want more Linux, go get Linux Unplugged. Don't forget, too, uh, one, of the, one of the ways you can keep us on the air is by using our browser extension. Yes. You can find that Very link at the important. bottom of Jupyter Broadcasting. You can get it from Chrome, Firefox. You can also search other browser marketplaces, but we have those linked at the bottom of the site. When you use those and you shop, especially with the holidays coming up, mm-hmm. a portion of your shopping session is contributed to Jupyter Broadcasting. It doesn't cost you anymore. It's a way to give yourself something and sure. give us a little something. And we use that to defer costs like our bandwidth, our gear, right. and things like that. It so. keeps us on the air. And even if you have it installed, make sure it's updated. Mm-hmm. And keep it in and mind. Active. Yeah, and active. And if you're shopping already, hey, you know, why not? And if you're on a machine that doesn't have it, we have a lot of the popular ones linked yeah. at the bottom of every page on Jupyter Broadcasting, like Amazon and Newegg and Best Buy. You click those before you shop, it does the same you're thing. You're at work. You don't want to install a plug-in. That's the perfect way to go. Shame on you. I mean, yes. Yes, you should be on LA. <laughs> you need to be watching LAS from work. That's yeah. important. Absolutely. Uh, we also want to hear from you. You can go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click that contact link and then choose Linux Action Show in the drop down. Or even better, start a thread in our subreddit over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. That's also where you can submit stories, comment on stories. Yep. We use all of that. All of that content over there heavily influences this show. It does. And it's, it's part of the open source process that is this fan podcast. Wow. All right, everyone, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. And two! And welcome. Hi. Hi. I hit my mic. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, man. Let's play season two. Let's play season two. Okay, so based on those early results, I'd say that Cinnamon has a dominant lead by uh, yeah. 70% of the votes. So we'll be doing Cinnamon Review next week. So I could have talked about this. DS Download is another app, as, it, as the name implies. Oh, I did talk about this. This is the download manager. So say like there's something, oh, right. you're browsing the web on your phone, you're like, shit, I'd really like to download that, but I don't want to download it on my phone. Exactly. You can use this to send the download job to the Synology box. And oh, the Synology seriously? box will download it. Dude, yeah. dude. Yeah. All right, coming up on this week's Route episode code. of the Linux Action Show, we're going to review a Synology NAS that runs Linux and has a few surprises in the box. We'll tell you all about that. Uh, I was expecting a lady's NAS, and I got a man's NAS. <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs>